I think it's, I think it's loading. All right, we're live. Cool, we figured it out. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. This is our first ever episode of Drunk Science. Um, we'll see how it goes. I'm just really <laughs> excited to drink and talk to people. Um, so my guest tonight is Imogene Cancellari. She is amazing. Imogene, do you wanna say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hey everybody. I'm super pumped, Serafina, to be included here tonight. Um, I know everybody is kind of stuck at home, so this is a great way to like connect with people and talk about cool stuff. Um, but yeah, so Serafina and I know each other from the wild world of Twitter, um, where we do totally different types of science, and I'm really to talk, eager to talk about how they uh, intersect because eventually they will. Um, but so for those of you, if you don't know me, um, my name is Imogen Cancellari. I am a conservation biologist and I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware where I am studying the genetic structure of snow leopards in Central Asia. And we'll get more into oh, that. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm gonna grill you for like hours, I'm so excited. Perfect. Um, okay, so to start off the show, I thought we can take a shot together and also like maybe share a cool fun fact about drinking and science. Okay. Um, my fun fact is probably gonna be your fun fact because you just brought it to me a second ago. So okay. you wanna share it? <laughs> Perfect. You want me to share it? Yeah, you go. Okay, so obviously drinking is a fun pastime for some people and science is a fun pastime for people, but there is a peer reviewed research that shows that alcohol in low amounts, particularly specifically beer can help promote creativity in the brain. So like there's some caveats to that. Um, one, be, uh, spirits and wine does not apply to what I'm getting ready to say. And two, lots of alcohol does not apply to what I'm getting ready to say. But if you're having a hard time being creative, whether it's with writing or painting or whatever the case may be, if you like drink a single beer, it can in fact increase the uh, productivity, creativity neurons in your brain and actually make you feel slightly less inhibited. That's so funny. I do it when I'm writing. <laughs> okay, so we should take a shot and then I wanna ask questions about that because I already have questions. Okay. Okay, um, what are you taking a shot of? I have, I'm, I'm bourbon. Generally, yeah. that's my go-to if I'm yeah. going to drink This spirit. is our, our whiskey uh, hour or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, whiskey is my go-to drink. Um, today, so normally I have to like have to like make a caveat to this. I'm not a super fancy person, but if I'm going to drink whiskey neat, which is my preference, I like to drink something a little nicer, which currently in my pantry I have Knob Creek. However, for like mixers or for like shooting it like this, I like to take it down a notch. So right now I will be uh, shooting some Evan Williams. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. I have a shot of Woodford and I accidentally poured myself a double shot, which I, it was a mistake, but I'm going to go for it at least. Okay. 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 Are we ready? We are. Okay. One, two, three. Cheers. Cheers. Excellent. <laughs> God, it's, <coughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> um, okay. So my first question about your fun fact, why okay. doesn't, why is beer the one that works? Like why not wine or hard alcohol? I don't remember what the paper said. I think it, I think it might have something to, something to do with the fact that you have, you, okay. So like every standard drink, so like, you know, a shot of liquor or like a, a bottle of beer, like a 12 ounce serving of beer, yeah, fill up all of your different alcohols at the same time. Yeah, sorry. So, so like, you know, your standard, like, two-ounce shot of liquor and, like, a 12-ounce uh, uh, beer. I think it's 12 ounces, not six. This is 12 ounces, but I think in this case it's 12 ounces. And, what, nine ounces of wine? Those all have the same amount of alcohol in them. So in terms of my body processing it, my body is going to process this or is going to have to process it a lot more quickly than if I'm slowly drinking a beer. So I think that might have something to do with it. Okay. Um, I don't think that's all of the story, though. And I'm going to open this because I can feel like the bourbon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I had to, I had to have the only thing that I have in my apartment right now that is not water or alcohol is Gatorade because I was like, maybe I'll get some Gatorade. So. You're prepared though. I mean, it's a yeah. handy beverage for some, but it also like, I grew up drinking that when I was a kid, when I was sick. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Always the blue Gatorade, never any other color. I think. Oh, okay. So you're blue. Mine was always um, citrus cooler. <laughs> Ooh, that is very specific. <laughs> it is very specific. I was okay. a picky child. 
So tell me a little bit about what you do, how you got into science, how you got into your specific field and what you love most about it. And that was like 10 questions, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so when I was, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a dairy goat farm in North Carolina. And like we grew, you know, rural North Carolina. So like we had, you know, like the farm and we had this family property and there's a creek running through the property. So like most of my childhoods were spent in the back part of the farm, like along this muddy creek, watching tadpoles metamorphose into terrestrial frogs or toads. Um, and literally like I would just like constantly try to catch like cricket frogs or like bullfrogs or tree frogs all the time and watch them change. But I really had no idea that people did that kind of thing for a living. Um, because I grew up on a farm, my only, I guess, experience in terms of people who like animals are people who are veterinarians. So I went right. to college thinking, you know, like I was pre-vet, I was like, oh, I'm going to like, you know, get my DBM. I'm going to probably work on livestock or something. Like I'll have my own farm. I'll take care of them. Like blah, blah, blah. Did you have a favorite animal at that point? Or was it like, I just want to work with animals, period? Yeah, it was most like, I just want to work with animals, period. Like I was super into goats. <laughs> now that I'm like saying that, it sounds really, really nerdy. And I was in fact a nerdy child. Um, it was like a toss between goats. I and love stuff. that. I mean, kid, kids, right? Those are baby goats. Yes, you're correct. Yep. So cute. Yes. And like, if I can do a real quick humble brag, I showed dairy goats for like 10 years. So it's like, think of like dog shows, but with goats. Yeah. And I have like 12, like actual, like gold trophies that are like this, Holy that are like, shit. Like, tall and they have like a giant gold goat on them. I don't have them here, so I can't show you. But Oh my God. Do you anyways. have videos from this? Because at some point I need to see this. this I will. I'll have to find them. Um, so I was super into goats, which, you know, it's like, okay, goats are livestock for in, in a lot of the world. It's like, I'll just go to vet school and be like a goat doctor or whatever. Um, <laughs> I kind of realized even though I was into goats, I wasn't really interested in just like veterinary medicine. Exactly. The main reason I was only interested in veterinary medicine was one, like animals are cool, but two, I was really interested in more like complex processes. So like, I liked watching these weird looking little tadpoles that didn't have bones, like sprout little legs, like out of their little like neck tail body thing. Totally. And then, you know, slowly like actually change. So the whole process of figuring out how things work is more interesting to me. And okay. so that's why I wanted to go to vet schools because I love the idea of surgery. You know, like people talk about like fixing clocks because they want to open things up and see how they work on the inside. And I, not to sound like a serial killer, but like that's why surgery is an interesting concept because if you open something up, you can see how it works, right? Totally, yeah. So like yeah. that's why I wanted to be a veterinarian. Kind of. um, you know, like I'm, my parents were pretty supportive. I mean, I think my mom probably thought I was going to be a serial killer at one point because like our cat died. And, you know, like all the neighborhood kids knew her. So my mom's like, well, you know, how do we handle like the idea of like death and mortality with like a bunch of five-year-olds and six-year-olds? We'll have a funeral. And everyone will say nice things about Mary the cat. And we did this and we finished the funeral. And I, like, there was like a moment of silence. And I was like, all right, can we cut her up? Shut like, I want to see door. what makes Mary tick, mom. <laughs> Dying. Wait, mom, how old like, were you at this point? Uh, like six or seven, Holy I think. Shit. And my mom's like, wow, my child's going to be a serial killer. Like she also like rips the heads off of her Barbie dolls. Like, where did oh, I go? That's so cool though. That's awesome. Did, so you, she, did you, did you? No, she was like, absolutely not. Like I'm not like psychologically healthy enough to, to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> but my grandfather was a doctor on my mom's side. So like, I think that might've been part of it. Okay. Um, but anyways, I promised this long journey of getting to answer your question, why I'm interested in science. Um, all of that is to say, I really am fascinated by how things work. Um, and obviously I still love animals and I love wildlife. And I did this really cool study abroad um, my third year in college in Australia, where we were looking at the interface between livestock and wildlife and how does, how do farmers in Australia deal with things like, you know, herds of kangaroo, like running through their cattle ranches. Um, we had all these cool lectures. And I remember this one day we were, you know, we had just gotten, we just finished this dehorning exercise. I had like cows, like you can actually dehorn them in a way that it's, it's not painful. So like uh, cattle, their okay. horns are hollow and they don't have like a blood supply all the way through. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry. They do have a blood supply, but it's not like major arteries or veins. Like if you cut it off, um, it's not going to like kill them. And if you anesthetize the area, you can basically effectively take like metal wire and like saw it off. A veterinarian should be doing this, not like, you know, me in my backyard, but we did this exercise, which is really cool and interesting, like, you know, with a veterinarian, but then we like immediately filed inside and had this lecture about coral reef die off. 
And I remember like sitting there, you know, as an undergrad, like, you know, like my chin up, my mouth hanging open and yeah. just like, looking at the difference. I was like, wow, like I just cut this like cow's horns off and that was really cool. But like, why are coral reefs dying? Oh my God. And so for me, it was this huge paradigm shift. And that made me realize it was that one I just, moment. It was, it was just that, it was just that really weird moment, man, like in wow. Australia. And I was just like, I don't want to be a veterinarian. Like, obviously like, this is why I am not like vibing with it. Like, I don't, I don't. I don't, I'm not cut out to be a veterinarian and I'm still, you know, an undergrad. Um, and so like from that on, they're on it. Like I totally switched. I was like wildlife. Like I have to, there has to be like something bigger that I can do. And so how can I combine my interests in a way that is like satisfactory, but also meaningful. Sure. Um, Did you and that really kind of coral reefs after that? Were you like, okay, this is really fascinating. And that's no, like no, I wasn't even, I wasn't even like super into like marine biology. Wasn't like, I like dolphins as a kid, but like it wasn't even marine biology. I was like, all right, cool. Like, what can I do that doesn't require me to get in the ocean and like, you know, come into contact with giant squid, which we can talk sure. about later because I have opinions about giant oh, squid. Oh God, yes. I'm um, they're cool, but a little, it's intense, you know? Like you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be allowed to have like six arms, two, <laughs> you shouldn't use it as like six uh, tentacles and something else is, uh, Sarah McAnulty would be like slapping me right now because I can't remember my terminology. But anyways, you shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be allowed to have eight usable. No, amendments. it's too much. It's too No much. bones and a beak. Like I'm not about that. Yeah, no, I'm anyways. with you. Very much. Anyways, so it wasn't ever about marine science for me. Um, I've always been interested in like terrestrial wildlife, like I said, um, but in my, the city where my college was, there was an accredited tiger sanctuary. Um, and I applied to be an intern there and I don't know why they hired me. Before? Like, were you interested in tigers before that? Or were you just like, I mean, right, interested, I guess interested as much as like any person is like, it's a fucking tiger. Like, of course they're awesome. But I wouldn't say that I had like this, uh, uh, affinity prior to that. I was like, oh, tigers are amazing. And then when I learned that tigers were like 15 miles from my apartment, yeah. and I could like learn about them or do something or care for them in like a meaningful way which obviously I see some questions here in like the Slack about Tiger King, which we'll totally talk about. And it wasn't a facility like that. I applied to intern there and they accepted me, I guess, because of all that goat raising that I had done as a kid um, and, you know, worked there for a year. And that really is what uh, kind of started me on the path to where I am, what, like what I'm in now, which is particularly carnivore ecology. So I mostly study the relationship that terrestrial carnivores have with their environment in different ways. And, and like the tool that I use to do that is genetics. Okay. All right. Sorry. I have a lot. That was a long monologue. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. Okay. Wait, first question, because I think someone asked this in the chat is coral mining illegal. I think so. Yeah. I don't, I would imagine, but again, I mean, I, I look up there. I don't know. Anything. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Googling guys. I totally know everything. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, but back to, okay, so when you were working with tigers in this internship, what was, like, were you focusing on a specific thing, or, like, what was your internship like? Yeah, so the cool thing about the intern, so I worked at a great facility called Carolina Tiger Rescue. Um, when I started there, they were called, see, this was in 2009, so I'm, like, dating myself. Um, it was 2009, and they were, uh, they, they went by the name Carnivore Preservation Trust, but they changed it to Carolina Tiger Rescue, like, right after I got there, like, okay. rebranding. Um, no new people, not rebranding in terms of like changing their practices. They just wanted like an updated name, primarily because the history of the facility shows some really solid evolution. Like when the people who started the facility in like the 70s were not involved when I was there, they hadn't been involved in decades, but they did some really shady shit. Like they were like breeding cats, kind of like what we saw in, in Tiger King. So is that which is not limited like people are like they're breeding stuff and like you know claiming they're helping conservation and stuff and they were operating under the name carnivore preservation trust so like when i got there they they hadn't they changed all these practices like 25 30 some years ago um, by the time i got there but they really wanted to also change their name so they can completely erase any, it. You know, association because it truly weren't the same place they were just okay. still on the same property but not the same doesn't that happen in tiger king too don't they rebrand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, but what is it? Jeff Lowe's group. They've rebranded and now they have like, they're building like a new facility. So, you know, they can like start over. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. so like, I understand doing that if things really do change. That's, that's also what Carol Baskin did. Like, you know, she had, was doing some shady shit in the nineties and for whatever reason she changed her tune and completely rebranded right. and is doing like ethical things, which I'm sure people have lots of questions about. Yeah. Um, but I was at Carolina Tiger Rescue, you know, like it was like, a, it's like a 55 acre facility. I can't remember how many animals we had when I was there. So we had like 
we had tigers, um, we had bobcats, caracals, servals. We also had ventrons, which is not Sorry, a cat. What were those words that you just said? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We had tigers, bobcats, okay. caracals, what are ocelots, those? and servals. And so those are small cat species. Okay, got it. Um, we also had binturons, which they're not cats. They're like eight, they're, they're called Asian bear cats, but they are uh, procyonids. They're more, they're basal uh, in, they're, they're basically related to uh, other procyonids, which are like the raccoon family. Um, okay. We also had kinkajous, um, which are, I don't remember what group they're in. Don't judge I, me. I, I should know this because I used to be the model team. So. Um, but so like we had all these animals and like my job as an intern was to help the keepers do, you know, things that needed to be done on any given day basis, which, you know, like I get out there, like after my classes or I get out there at like 12, like at lunchtime and it's time to like feed the tigers or feed the small cats, you know, so I would assist with that, but I would also do things like assist with deworming. Um, and every intern was assigned like a certain section of the park. So like, I'm not responsible, even though I might be helping the keepers feed all of the animals, a majority of like my shifts and my days were spent focused on like a smaller subset of animals. So like I had a couple of tigers, I had some ocelots, caracals and servals that I was kind of responsible for from like an enrichment perspective. What does that mean? What I worked at was no touch. So like I, we did not ever go into a cage with an animal. We shifted them to clean their cages. You know, the food was either put through a chute or like hurled over the fence. So everything is like no actual physical interaction. So there's no need to put like human or animal at risk. That's amazing. Um, interaction. And that like, that's the way it should be. Like we had like friendly cats and stuff, but you know, it's like, you know, a friendly tiger is like friendly until it's not, you know what I mean? So like, that's right. obviously the risk. Yeah. I um, mean, so enrichment is basically like the, one of the necessary things in, in zoo facilities that you need is like, you have this animal that has a home range, like a bobcat, for example, this small, like, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 40 pound wild, small wild cat can have a home range that's like up to 80 square miles in, you know, some parts of the US. So you put it in, you know, like oh. an enclosure that's like an acre or even half an acre, it's not even remotely adequate. There's no way that you can actually do that. Um, right. And so like, you need to be able to try to enrich them in order to create the best accepted practices in captivity. And so that means like keeping their, keeping them exercise, but also keeping their brains clicking. So like, yeah. We would do things like um, with cats that liked it because not everybody likes the same thing. We had some ocelots that love to play tug of war. So we would get like this really, really thick rope that was like this Aww. thick and put it through like the chain link fence uh, when they were away. So they couldn't like come and grab your hands and you would just let them grab it and pull. And you'd, you know, we'd stand like six feet away from the fence and basically like play tug of war. And that I got like photos. Awesome. It was so cool because these little like 12 pound ocelots, we had this one ocelot who was like super amped up all the time. His name was Petey. And I think he weighed like 13 pounds. And you know, like I'm, I'm five, three, I'm like, you know, 140 pounds or something. And we're playing like tug of war. And this ocelot is just eating the rope. I mean, he's just pulling it in like it's nothing. And I finally have to let go because if we start with like 25 feet of rope, and I'm pulling as hard as I can. And this tiny little cat is just dragging me across the dirt like I'm a noodle. And so it was just like stuff like that, you know, you know, That's coming so up with an fun. enrichment project and building things like building platforms for them to be able to get on. So I focus on small cats. Like I, I dealt with the tigers um, as, as some as well, but I was really interested in small cats Why? Um, while I was there. So I focus on a lot of enrichment with them because small cats are super cool. Tigers are great, obviously, uh, but small cats are, you know, awesome. What makes them, what makes them awesome? Like, how do you, sorry, I'm asking you a million questions. No, it's okay. No, I love talking about this. Um, I mean, like, you know, all cats or all carnivores are interesting because they're, you know, like apex predators in whatever ecosystem they live in. Right. And so like a tiger is, is taking that to like another level, just like a, a bear or a wolf is, it's right. like, did you see that video of the bear pulling up the, fuck, what is it called? Like the orange cone on the side? Oh. No. Oh, it was awesome. He was like going down the road, just like rambling. And then there was an overturned orange cone and he just like picked it up and put it back up and then kept going. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> no, I have to look at it. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's why, like, but your story like exemplifies perfectly why these carnivores are so interesting, you know, like, cause they're, they're big, they're scary and they're intelligent and you know what I mean? They do interesting things and they can also kill us. And for some reason we have this weird fascination with that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, smaller cats serve all of the same purposes in those ecosystems if a step down, like, you know, you've got like tight, you know, you like, like mountain lion and bobcat, you know, like 
bobcats are basically a level, a trophic level below mountain lions because mountain lions are the biggest and they're like the top of the food chain. Um, and that's not a metaphor, it really is like a food chain. It's like a reverse pyramid or I guess, a, I guess depending on a pyramid, it's like the, the higher the higher level that you get in the pyramid, the less carnivores you're going to have. And at the right. top, the top of the pyramid is like your apex predators, like your mountain lion. But like right. below that, you're going to be like your miso carnivores. Um, and that's medium sized carnivore. And that's like things like bobcats or circles or ocelots. And I love them because they do all of the same stuff that like tigers or bears do just like on a slightly smaller level, but they still have the same attitude. It's, it's like the dog in your neighborhood that's really tiny, but he's just a huge asshole. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't know that he weighs like four pounds. Connor and, is like 50 pounds and will not, like he has such an attitude and he's, <laughs> he's not big enough to have that attitude. And it's like, bro, like if you meet a, a German right. shepherd, like a real German shepherd, or I mean, I love Connor, right? Like clearly, but right he's kind of an asshole <laughs> no exactly like, I have I have two cats and a dog and like one of my cats is 10 pounds and he's a total bully like he's just a jerk and my dog is 70 pounds and he's yeah. terrified of the cat yeah and it's just you know it's partially an attitude thing and I have never met a bobcat that didn't think that he could kick your ass and your mom's ass and your cousin's ass and then his cousin's ass <laughs> they're just they have so much attitude and without like trying to anthropomorphize them too much they just yeah. they have to be on that level like they're their level of, of vigilance is so intense and the way that they navigate their landscape is so fascinating that I think that they are just like equally awesome. They're just, you know, a little smaller so they don't cool. get quite as much, they don't have quite as much allure as maybe like a right. lion or a tiger does. Right. Okay, so you did this internship and yes. you decided afterwards, okay, this is definitely what I want to continue studying and, and looking into. Did you start a research project after that? How did you decide I want to do this in grad school and this is maybe what I want to do my career on? Yeah, so for me, it was mostly like when I realized I didn't want to be in vet school, I realized that my major choice was horrible, um, <laughs> which my, so my bachelor's degree is in animal science and it's really a useless degree. Why? If you are a major in animal science, I'm very sorry to say that. Um, it is it is not a very um, flexible degree outside of food animal medicine, food animal production, or vet school, in my opinion. Oh, wow. Uh, because it focuses so much on like animal husbandry and medicine and, and best practices for livestock. So some of that helps me a little, that helped inform me a little bit when I started working in the tiger sanctuary and it's like, you know, oh, is this place legitimate? Like, what are they doing? Like, right. what, you know, how are they caring for these animals? Like how do, how did their like medical uh, treatments work? How did the protocols work? And I had some familiarity with that, you know, from like working on a farm and in my degree. And obviously like, it's basically a matter of like taking care of the animal, meeting the resource needs, providing medical care, taking care of them, stuff like that. And so like that, that was helpful. Um, but yeah, so like it doesn't really set me up for much outside of that. And when I realized that I didn't want to go to vet school, I was like, well, you know, if I want to get a job that cares about the degree that I have, like this ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so like I started taking some extra, it took an extra year um, to graduate. I took kind of a victory lap because I wanted to take some extra classes. Oh yeah. To try to make up for those deficits. And since I knew that I wanted to, I, I basically decided that I wanted to be a wildlife biologist from some of those courses that I took. Cool. based on like the conversations I had during my study abroad and while I was at Tiger Sanctuary. Um, and so I, you know, really was interested in like carnivores at that point. And that really like kind of reignited maybe a bit of a childhood interest. I was super into cheetahs. I was like, man, I am going to go out in the world and I'm going to fucking save the cheetahs. Like, I, that's it. Like, you because know. because they're so fast because they're so beautiful like yeah all of that like all of the reasons that we like selfishly love something you know I was like cheetahs yeah. are fast they're cool they're awesome and they're like slightly different from the rest of the cats because their claws aren't retractable fully <laughs> retractable and they're just you know they run real yeah. fast you know like so like you know, imagine like a super amped up like 21 year old you know like the archetype of like girl loves cats yeah you know, like, like I was on that level. Um, That's awesome. And, you know, it is. It's great. And, it, you know, having that passion is important, but I took a really great class and my professor, she is, you know, I admire her to this day, but she sat me down and she was like, Imogene, you're not ever going to be a cheetah biologist. Why? And I was like, whoa, slow your roll because we're about to have words on this. Like, who are you to tell me that I'm not going to be able to do this? And, and basically I heard you can't do this. What she meant was you can't do this 
in the straight line that you think you can. And what I'm, and what she meant by that was having a lot of interest in a species or even having a lot of like knowledge about like the behavioral history or like the, the natural ecology or just like knowing fast facts about your favorite species does not qualify you to be a wildlife biologist or a researcher on said species. Right. Because realistically, like I am, you know, I know plenty of people, like I know a lot about cheetahs, but guess what? It has not helped me at all because I have never gotten a job working on cheetahs, like not at a research position, not an internship, um, you know, like not a job. And that's fine. And the reason, but but the reason that it's fine is because a other things are really interesting. And I learned that by taking jobs after undergrad, like my first job was on bot, we uh, tracking radio collared bobcats outside of Glacier National Park. And then I worked on like Glacier is the most beautiful place I've ever been. It is. No, it's amazing. I love it. I I I lived in Whitefish, Montana, which is up by the border. Like beautiful part of the world. We'll come back now. I'll put a pin in that. You know, but then I worked on bears. I've worked on on uh, fishers and martins, which are mycelids. I've worked on um, you know, like amphibians. I've worked on a lot of different taxa. So I've learned that there are a lot of other interesting things. But more importantly, what I learned is that knowing a lot about like cheetahs or knowing a lot about tigers doesn't qualify you to actually help them because science is about questions. It's not about like knowing the answers. It's not about like knowing like little tidbits about their history because no animal is like a standalone species. Everything in nature is connected to everything else. And so in order to help like snow leopards, I have to not only understand how they are situated in their ecosystem, but I have to understand what that means in terms of conservation questions. And so then, you know, if you pick a question or you pick a discipline, you have to be able to have the tools to answer those. And so realistically, the only way that I am able to do what I do today is because I have a skill set that's needed. So I am I call myself a conservation biologist um, because I work, I do research that directly applies to conservation of a given species, but it's not limited to big cats. Although I will say that, you know, I, so I've worked on several different, I've worked on bobcats, ocelots, clouded leopards, um, and, and snow leopards, wild species. And so I'm not including the sanctuary work in, in that statement. Um, but all of the work that I've done is particularly, uh, it's molecular ecology. So I do lab work. So like I mostly work with Uh, DNA in order to answer conservation questions. And that's a current need. And so that's kind of like my niche or gateway into doing what I do. Can you talk a little bit about the like direct, I guess, like how lab work directly impacts conservation? Yes, I can. Um, So I'm super excited about lab work. Um, So like my job is combining field work and lab work. So I go out into the field and I collect biological data that you then bring to the lab to answer conservation questions. And there's two reasons that's important. One, you can answer questions and determine things about individual animals as well as populations without ever having to come come into contact with the animal. So there are a lot of science questions that require us to like call our radio collar animals. um, And that's important. But there are also a lot of questions that you can answer without ever having to come into contact with them. Wow. And that's important because like radio call, like, you know, capturing an animal, radio collaring it, following it around, like that's all stressful. Right. Um, it costs money, it costs people's time. Like there are a lot of risks involved with that. Um, obviously people that are doing that account for all of those. So it's not like I'm, I'm not dogging uh, that work because I've done that work and it's, you know, done, done well and done right. It's very important, it's very safe, it's, it's good. Um, but the work that I do allows us to answer questions about species that we have a hard time coming into contact with. Right. So like, I could go out in, in, in the mountains of Central Asia all day and try to catch snow leopards, but I might only ever catch like two. I how might... rare are snow leopards? Like what, how do you, what are- I'll try to, I, got, I should share a screen, I'll share a screen later. Um, snow leopards are in 12 countries in Central Asia. So if you think about, if you think wow. about Central Asia, like think about like Russia, Mongolia, uh, they're in a lot of the stands. So Kazakhstan, Kyrg- Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. They're in uh, uh, the tip of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and uh, 60% of their range is in the high elevation mountains of China. Wow. So they're all, uh, they're all high elevation specialists. So they're not distributed throughout all of those countries. They're just in these, they're, they're connected. Uh, all these populations are maybe connected through the mountain ranges. And I'm doing this, like you can see a map. It's a C, <laughs> I'm thinking of a C shape. The distribution is this C shape. Um, but snow leopards, you know, are really difficult to find. They're very rare and elusive. And out of all of the big cats and certainly out of all the big cats and certainly out of a lot of the wild cats, we know very little about snow leopards compared to other species. Um, And so like the work that I'm doing is beneficial because 
you can go out in the woods and maybe you're setting, I'm sorry, not the woods, you can go out in the mountains and maybe you're setting a camera trap because you're trying to document snow leopards, or maybe you're setting a trap to try to catch snow leopards for a different project. And you, maybe you don't, maybe you see a snow leopard, maybe you don't. Right. But if you go to where snow leopards are, that means that you're going to likely at some point encounter fecal material that was left by a snow leopard. And here's that, the proof, I get it. That is the unit of measurement that I use to answer conservation questions. So I literally go out into the, into the mountains and I pick up cat poop. My job is literally, it, I, I meddle in cat wow. poop. And so you go pick up the cat poop, we're just gonna pretend this bottle opener is cat poop, and you bring it back into the lab and you extract host DNA or snow leopard DNA off of the scat. And you're able to, like once you extract the DNA, you can use molecular markers to identify individuals. And then from that, you can answer your big conservation questions. Like, do we know how many there are in this area? How are they, wow. how um, similar or different are these populations? What is a population and where are they? And so where are migrants like, oh, maybe there's 500 kilometers between these two populations, but they're genetically similar. So we know that snow leopards are moving between these habitats. And so it helps you kind of understand not only like numbers and populations, like I said, but it also helps you understand how snow leopards fit into their world. Like maybe they don't live in this part of the world, but they can travel through it. So it's important for their conservation. Sure. And so, so then, you know, you that's- from poop? Sorry. What's that again? How can you tell their sort of like travel patterns, for example, from poop? I mean, like, yeah. can you track it? Like, no, no I mean, like, kind of. So if you do repeated transects, like I have colleagues that go out there several times and basically, so like you go out into the, into the mountains once and you collect all the cat poop and then you wait like a certain period of time and you go out again and collect all the, the new cat poop. And then you compare like how many unique individuals did I, did I get during uh, search one and how many unique individuals did I get during search two and how many of them did I recapture? And based you on like this that from the recapture, you can try to estimate like populations, yeah, uh, like population numbers. But in terms of movement, basically like you know, an animal defecates, that doesn't necessarily mean anything about their movement other than they use this area, they use this area. But in terms of like relatedness, you know, breeding, you know, when an animal breeds, they're basically, you know, dropping breadcrumbs in, in terms of like connections or like maybe not breadcrumbs, let me think. Like if we all had a string connected to our backs and, and you can basically create a web of interaction. And so like, you know, like these two snow leopards breed and then like their offspring goes over here and then these two snow leopards breed and they go over here and you're basically tracing invisible lines that connect these snow leopards. And so basically I, if I know that there's like a big uh, river like right here and I get snow leopard scat here and here I can determine, okay, are these the same individual? If they are wow. the same, well, I know that the snow leopard, this is not a barrier to their gene, to their movement. If I see that they're related, I know that at some point, like a relative of snow leopard A mated with somebody, you know, over here, and that's, sure. you know, they're, they're related in some capacity, or maybe there's, you know, this is actually a true barrier to movement, and there are two populations that are partitioned or separated by, you know, whatever landscape variable there might be. And so that's why I said it helps us understand, like, their uh how they're situating their ecosystems because we can then try to correlate spatial patterns and genetic structure like what is the the spider web or puzzle of their gene flow and you can look at that in the context of like geography and landscape very that's like, so cool and so that's mostly what i do is landscape genetics which is correlating like geography um, and like biogeography and evolutionary history with you know current like population structure it's like basically one map is genetics one map is like the landscape and you lay them over top of one another to see how you know the landscape might be influencing like the genetic structure that you're observing. Do you weight certain variables of like a specific landscape structure more than others in order to like model it well or is it yes no that's like a good question like, no one asked that so like you can Sorry. do <laughs> no you can do model. resistance modeling uh with uh like movement so you can do that with like you know like if you collared a bunch of animals and you wanted to um try to like map how they move you do that and but you, you so you say oh, sorry let me back up so like say you have a bunch of radio collared animals and you want to, like you understand how they move but then you want to use that data to inform like you want to use that data set to kind of extrapolate to mm -hmm. understand like how they would move to right. predict their movements in another area. Right. One of the things that you would do is take like the information you have like oh, like these radio collared bobcats avoided agriculture. So maybe it has 
a higher resistance value than like this forest landscape, mm -hmm. which they seem to use a lot. So in terms of like your mathematical modeling, you would assign like a higher resistance factor or resistance number to that. And then, you know, basically in terms of modeling, if even if you don't have collar data, you can use that same concept based on Bobcat ecology to do like, um, like if you think if there are any people here in here that like physics or like electricity, if you think about like the power of electrical systems, like, you know, moving like a charge moves from point A to point B. Nailed it. Stronger if there's less resistance and there's a whole like modeling or there's like a whole program that basically helps you model movement based on resistance values. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So how much of your time, sorry, I'm like trying to answer or ask questions that people are asking. I'm sorry. I'm not looking. I'm just like no. blabbing right now. No, I know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not giving you any time to breathe, but um, so how much of your time is based in the lab? How much of the time is in the field? Do you wish it were more of one or the other? And in your, if you, do you go camping? Do you do any backpacking? And how, like, do you do that on your trips? Like, how does that work? I ask as a camper slash backpacker. Yeah, um, so I, I used to. So before my master's, I worked for two years as an assistant, like a research assistant on a very, like a bunch of different projects. Um, so I was collecting data for other people's projects. And so like, that's where I said I was working on like a bear project. I was working on like mustelids. So I was working in different parts of the country. Um, and when I worked in California, um, we, we basically where camped. Where in California were you? So we were on Sierra and Sequoia National Forest, like not cool. far from Yosemite. Yeah. So I worked for several months out there for the United States Forest Service. We were doing a monitoring project on fishers and martens. So those are mustelids. So like think of like a, a ferret um, and think of a wolverine and think somewhere in the middle and that's both of those species and they're cute and they're like vicious little miso carnivores that have like terrible attitudes and i just love them um and so we were out there uh trying to collect genetic data and also collect uh, evidence on camera traps and we were um we had teams that were doing front country front country camping and teams that were doing back country camping so i was one of the team members that did front country camping which means that we went to like a campsite we had to haul in everything like all of our food and water for the week um excuse me, and we would go out and like do all of our transects during the day, but then we would come back to that same campsite. So we had like no electricity, no internet, obviously like we brought in our own water. Um, pretty remote, we did that for three months. Um, but then like we had other teams that were doing backcountry camping. So like they they took everything on their back. Right. So it wasn't coming back to the same place. They just did like a through hike. It was like a circle or whatever for their different transects. Right. Um, and so I've had lots of jobs where it's basically some version of that. You know, like when I, I worked in Washington on a Wolverine project in the winter and we were in like a remote cabin um for the forest service i'm trying to think if that's i think those are the only two jobs that i had to camp regularly that's amazing um, did you like it i did and so like you know that's something that i love to do for fun and for my job um and then for my phd i have been able to do lab work and field work so for me it's really as much as i love lab work like not a lot of people love lab work but i do i love the monotony of it i love like like I said, like the whole like figuring out how the clock works kind of thing, like that right. really like, satisfies this like maybe anal retentive, repetitive interest that I have. Totally. Um, but I didn't want to just be a lab person because it can get grueling and I love being outside. So it was kind of important to me to try to build a career that I can maintain field work and lab work. Um, in your field or in your, in your specialty, is it easy to combine the two? Like, do a lot of people do that? Not always, because realistically, like if you have an organization, you have someone that's like, not everybody, so you can't, you can't have one person specialize in everything. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not that important or that smart. So that's why you have teams. Like you have a team person right. who goes out in the field and you have people that do lab work. So like, you know, I'm in the unique position that people that do field-based research are not always adept at, at, at safely. And I guess, what is the word I want to use? They're not, if you're a field person, you're not a lab person. So they don't necessarily understand the nuance behind how do you uh, collect a sterile fecal sample that's not contaminated, particularly when like it's literally shit. So isn't it already contaminated? Having to be able to like teach that is relevant. So having someone who has some field expertise in my experience has been relevant. So that's kind of why I've been able to do both. Um, I did, I spent a month in Kyrgyzstan last August doing field work. Like it was my field research project. So we were camping, um, how you was know, the whole time. It was awesome. What was that? How, I just said, how was that? I oh, was amazing. Like we like were at, um, I think the minimum, I think the lowest in elevation we were at was like 11,000 feet. And so we were camping wow. out there every night, you know, we go for several days to do transects and we're camping in tents. And then we would go back to our herders home for a night or two and then oh, go on to the next place. 
Did so, you sorry. organize the trip or how does that like? Yeah, so that trip was um, the, I, that trip was organized because I got a grant from National Geographic for that particular effort. Tell me uh, how you get a grant from Nat Geo. Like how no, I, was, I got an early career grant. So like, it's basically for people that are earlier in their career and you know, that, you know, have projects. And I wanted to collect more data in Kyrgyzstan because in terms of like snow leopard distribution, there's a lot, first of all, there's a lot that we don't know, but it seems like there's a possibility that this part of Central Asia might be regionally important for their genetic connectivity. So I wanted to get more samples to spatially connect like Northern Kyrgyzstan and some of it's filling some get the gaps between like the border so cool. of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Yeah, and I, if I got enough samples then maybe I could do some like land, like some fine scale landscape genetic analyses. So we went to a place um, that has not previously been sampled for genetic testing. Like, you know, the, the local herders know smell leopards are there, you know, Kyrgyz researchers know smell leopards are there, but they haven't done a concerted effort um, at all in that area, just, you know, because there are other areas that are more important and they certainly Why? have Do like you think a, it's very difficult to get there or what is it about that yeah, region? A combination of things. So like it's the, the first thing that, you know, is important about some leopard habitat is it's really high elevation. It's really difficult to get to. So there's seasonality. There's certain, part, certain parts of right. the year it's not safe to access because, you know, the snow is melting and you have these rivers that show up within 24 hours and you can't cross them. Right. Um, it's also really high elevation, but then there's also land, there's, there's, there's a government access issues and there's also, you know, working with local communities. So it's incredibly important. You know, I'm an American, I'm just some, you know, American woman, like I can't just like roll up in there and be like, hi, I'm here to like save yeah. your species. You know, I, it's not like that. Um, and so it requires being able to work with the Kyrgyz researchers as team members, as well as also establishing yourself as trustworthy in the local community. And I can be the nicest person in the world, but I'm not fluent in Kyrgyz and I know like right. five words in Russian. So I'm not, right. um, there's not any reason to trust me. So you we have collaborated with a translator. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like when I was in China and when I was in Kyrgyzstan, we had, and in Uzbekistan, we always had translators because like, I know, I know how to, you know, a couple of different words, like, you know, certain things are, you know, your food is really good. Thank you for having us. Hello. Thank you. But I'm not conversational. Um, you know, I'm, it's, you're trying, you're always trying, but it's not the kind of thing that is, uh, you know, it takes a lot more time um, and being immersed in the language than, than I have had time for. Sure. Um, and so, you know, playing or, or being able to do those things, like go on the field requires like the infrastructure and the trust and also having heard or saying, yes, you can go on this, this land you know, or yes, we will help you. But, you know, they can also say, oh yeah, you can go out there, but good luck. Like, I don't know where the hell all the snow leopards are. Um, and so we worked a lot with local herders that went up and they basically volunteered on the project with me to go take me to where they had seen snow leopards or we know that there are ibex here, which means we know that there are snow leopards here because the snow leopards have to eat something. Wow. Um, and so they would take us to areas where it's like, oh, we saw a snow leopard here six months ago. We saw one last year, or this has been a really good year for the Ibex. And so then we would do our transects. We would just kind of hike up. And that's when like the um, needle in a haystack kind of starts and you're looking for cat poop at that point. But, you know, yeah, sorry. I know it was like a bunny like trail. No, oh, this is, I, I will talk uh, to you literally. I was literally just thinking like, man, I want to talk to you forever. This is so. Oh, cool. no, thank you. Um, but, you know, I was able to do that, that, that field work and then, you know, bring all the samples back um, to store them in a lab setting until we can actually address these questions in a lab. It's so, like, I'm working with uh, a lab in Montana. I've also worked with labs, a lab in Ohio that's been really instrumental to our work, but I'm also supposed to be doing lab work in China and India. And obviously oh, currently wow. with the pandemic, that can't happen. And you know, like my university is shut down. So to answer your question, currently I'm not doing much of anything because I'm at home and I don't have a lab here. I have yes. a centrifuge in my house, but I don't have like a full you lab. You have a centrifuge in your house? Yeah, one of my friends gave me one, like just casually. Like I have a buddy who works in the private sector who does like genetic stuff. Holy shit, this is so cool. So no, no, the story is really weird. So one of my, my best friends is an entomologist in my department. Her name is Grace. And uh, our one of like where my husband and I used to live, our neighbor is a scientist. And like we decided that we wanted to help him like redesign the interior of his house because like he's like you know in his 30s and it still looks like a 19 year old lives there so grace and i were kind of like <laughs> let's like you know freshen the place up a little bit and like we kind of helped him revamp his house like um my husband and grace's husband like the four of us are all hanging out a lot so like we're all in this guy's house for a day and we were just like we like bought furniture on craigslist and like spruced the place up just 
for fun one day he kind of like we just kind of showed up at his house we're like hi Greg we're doing this and he's like what the hell is going on um and so he was like cleaning his house and he's like I don't need this I don't need this I don't need this he's like oh here's like a centrifuge that my company was getting rid of and I took it because it was new would you like to have it and I said yes so that's how I have a centrifuge in my house <laughs> this is insane oh my I don't god know I mean, maybe I'll start like one of those like a uh, dog genetic id companies in my garage or something i literally just submitted my dog's genetic id for yeah who did you no, use I, what did we use wisdom wisdom Wh they're one of the good ones we used it or one of our, our trainer did it as a gift we did embark we figured out what our dog is and it was we were not expecting it i see i'm kind of nervous that my dog is like 90% chihuahua or something. I will like, I'm gonna like, while you're at, that you're talking, I'm gonna pull up a photo of my dog and like show it to the yes. screen. So no, this if is everybody perfect. here can like guess what my dog is made of, yeah. I can guarantee you, you will not be correct. I like this game. We should do a, we should do a drinking game out of it. So everybody, right. okay. Can the internet see that? That's my dog. He weighs 70 what pounds. What a baby. Oh my He's God. a baby. He's a child. I um, love him. <laughs> okay, so everybody in the comments should submit what you think this dog is yes i'll find another photo so so you can see like maybe his full body but he's 70 pounds he's above my knee like he's a big dog um i love him. he's red and white i'm just trying to find a better photo so you guys can like actually see because i want you to make informed decisions like he's a mutt for sure so you can guess a couple of different things where did you get him we got him at the spca okay cool he's like super regal holy shit He's a big boy. He was also like 38 pounds when we got him and he was eight months old. And they're like, yeah, he'll probably be like 45 pounds. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's not how that works. And he just kept growing and he kept growing and he's just really tall. He's very tall. He's like a he deer. He's huge. He's beautiful. He he's is. a big boy. So if you can guess what you, his name is Rio, R-I-O. Oh, Rio baby. He is okay. um, terrified of her cats. He loves cabbage, but not carrots. Like, you know, dogs like, so a lot of dogs like to eat carrots. He wants to eat like raw cabbage. So like when I like peel a head of cabbage, he always take like the first layer off because it's like, like soggy. The whole thing to eat. No, oh, I should try that. Um, I'll take like off like a full like a uh, layer of it. You know, it's like the size of my hand. I just like hand it to him. He just eats it. Oh my God. I tried to give my dog a lemon once and he like freaked out and, and like went he to wasn't having it. He, he was not happy. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have Bernese Mountain Dog and something Beagle. I I honestly, all right, all right. I guess. Beagle Bernese. Uh, okay, so um, he does not have Bernese in him. He does not have Shepherd in him. Whoever guessed that he has Australian Shepherd, you were actually correct. He has he is twenty percent Australian Shepherd. Yeah, you're on the right track with Beagle, but that's not it. Hound Corgi and Shepherd. So whoever said Hound, you're correct. He is forty percent hound and he looks like a hound he's 20 percent um treen walker coon hound and 20 percent um american english coon hound we thought fox hound we thought he looked exactly like a fox yeah hound. i could not. see fox hound i could totally see fox hound are you ready for the others the other two yes he is um so he's six percent uh collie so lassie mm -hmm. and he is 22 percent rottweiler <laughs> oh well, yeah so no. we talking about this, and so let me get on my soapbox. So the problem with these businesses is that every all from a genetic perspective, all of the markers they use to identify the species are proprietary information, meaning that they had their experts use like the um, mitochondrial markers to identify a given species. But like the way I call it might be different from the way you call it, and because what? they don't tell us. What, how, like where in terms of like, if this is like your scale, like maybe I say this is a German Shepherd, but maybe you say this is a German Shepherd. And so if two companies are using different markers, you could get two different answers from the same dog. And so there's a little bit of like, take it with a grain of salt because, you know, I could literally use my centrifuge and start this business. Like, are they, have there been studies, uh, let's see, like comparing the different like wisdom versus like the various types i don't know but now i feel like i'm gonna go down that rabbit hole and figure it out and if not i'm gonna write an opinion piece about yeah, it I will be <laughs> um so we talk about a grain of salt obviously but uh it I, I like this one a lot because we have wondered since we got him like his tail is a little short it we have tried like we couldn't figure out did someone like cut it because yeah. it's not like a half tail it's not like a nubbin it's like a half tail 
Like, did he get it stuck in something? Did someone hack it off? Yeah. And so they don't send a picture. It's just buccal swabs. So it's literally just cheek swabs. And they said that he has a gene for a naturally bobbed tail. So like they, wow. they identified that without any information on our part. That so is I, wild. So I give them a little bit of credit, and they also can partition like um, match or mitochondrial lineages. So like you know, in terms of like genetic legacies, like your matcher line, like your the mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. So in terms of tracing, oh, really? yeah, it's all maternally inherited. So like we talk about like our societies being like patriarchal and like tracing, we trace like generations down through like our fathers and grandfathers, but all that's bullshit because all the information is all in the mothers. All it's all matrilineal DNA. And so what like this percentage has, of DNA is mitochondrial DNA. I don't know that answer. I is that, is that, I don't know. Well, like so there's the mitochondrial genome and there's like the nuclear genome. And so they're okay. totally separate. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't I'm know. Exactly I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like this test determined, like based on like the matrilineal DNA, I was able to like look at Rio, my dog's uh, like genetic pedigree. And basically his dad's side is all like purebred coonhound, purebred tree and walker coonhound. Like what? grandparents are purebred. And then his dad is a 50-50, like there was an oops or someone like mixed those two breeds. Right. So his dad is 50-50 of those two. And then on his mom's side, there are purebred Rottweilers and then there is an Australian Shepherd Collie mix. So like if you're breeding dogs, like a, an Australian Shepherd, like the last year, kind of similar. So it makes sense. Like maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there was an oops where someone's Rottweiler bred with someone's Australian Shepherd Lassie mix. And that is Rio's mom. Rio's mom is a, if you go, if you're, if you're watching right now, hop onto the Googler and look up <laughs> Australian Shepherd mix. It's an interesting looking dog and it doesn't look like a hound. And she, that dog, you know, got knocked up by Rio's dad, which was a hound. And that's resulted in my very strange child. I want to meet your dog. He's a very sweet dog. He's he sounds amazing. Dog. I think he would get along with Comet. Comet heard we were talking about dogs or something. And now he's, he has three balls and can't decide which one he wants to chew on. And so he's like going crazy right now, right next to me. And I, I would show you guys, but I, I don't know how to. You, you had to like ruin the whole setup. Yeah. Like I, I don't know how to do that, but um, anyway. Okay. So I have, again, a million questions and I'm trying to figure out which one I want to ask. There have been some questions in the comments, which I feel like we should go for. First. Yeah, let's go look at the comments. Sorry guys, if we haven't gotten to yours yet. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so um, let's see. How Here's long a good one. Yeah, you go. It says, does any prey DNA survive digestion? Yes, that is the bane of my existence. Because ultimately when you do a DNA extraction, you like, you're literally, I'm just going to pretend that this bottle of Guinness. Extra you said you have good. poop samples, right? I do. And I will get there. Okay. okay. So if this is your poop, obviously it's anything that the animal, sorry, I'm just making sure I don't flip it. Anything that the animal ingested is now in this stool sample. However, when any mammal defecates, or I guess, I'm sorry, any animal with an intestine, like your reptiles and, and amphibians, when they defecate, you know, the fecal material moves through your, lar your small, your large intestine. Hey, sorry, do some, do some animals not have intestines? I guess like your single, your, your, uh oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And I was trying like, oh, I was trying to think of, I guess it would be different. Like, sorry, you're like birds would have intestines, but like they defecate and urinate basically out of the same orifice. So like it, oh, would, okay. I don't know how, like, I don't know how reliable it is to get DNA out of that sample, but yeah, sorry to back up any animal that has intestines, like when they are pushing their waste through their intestines, you know, you, you have DNA all over your body. It's not just in certain areas of the body. It's obviously everywhere. Like you're literally like shedding DNA constantly and your intestines also have your DNA. So when this stool sample is sliding through your intestines, epithelial cells from your intestines get sloughed off onto the outer layer of the stool sample. And so when this stool sample exits the body of the animal and lays down on the mountain for imaging to come find six months later, it's got target DNA or snow leopard DNA on the outer edge of the fecal sample. And so my job is to extract DNA from the sample. However, to answer the question, the problem is that I'm going to not only be extracting snow leopard DNA, but I'm going to be extracting DNA from anything that it ate. And so when it comes, the way that we get around that, there's two different ways. The first and most important way is that we don't do, for DNA tests, we don't just take cross sections. So I don't just like, you know, snip off the end and like 
you know, crush up that. I'm interested in the outer layer. So I literally basically take a scalpel and I shave off the outer layer of the fecal material because that's where all of the target or the epithelial cells of the snow leopard, that's where the DNA that I'm interested in is likely to be. So once I have that material, then I run it through the extraction process. And when I do that, there's still the likelihood that I'm going to have prey DNA because the prey DNA is going to be like 90% of the fecal material. It's only going to be like five or 10% of like my snow leopard DNA. Right. So that's when you use specific molecular markers. Like if I'm going to go do a PCR, which is a polymerase chain reaction, it's basically a, a series, it's a machine that runs uh, your DNA sample through a series of uh, heating cycles to make bajillions of copies of DNA that you're interested in. So we use molecular markers that are specific to snow leopards to bind to the DNA that, that I've extracted and then amplify only that DNA like millions and millions of times. Mm. And so then at that point, I'm basically, I have a million copies of snow leopard DNA and I don't really have very many copies of like my prey DNA. That's awesome. So then when I take that Amplicon or basically that product that have, has a million amplifications of snow leopard DNA, I can then run that through a sequencer to read out the base pair differences of those of that amplified DNA. And basically, I, I, it, it's no longer at that point confused with like your prey DNA. Okay. But certain molecular markers, it's a problem because certain ways that you amplify it also will amplify like your non-target DNA. So making sure you distinguish between the two is really important, but you can also use those same methods to do diet analyses by amplifying the DNA of whatever the snow leopard ate. Because basically you get a fecal sample, you know, you can get bones and hairs and you can do an analysis, like you can look under a microscope and say, okay, that is like a raccoon hair or uh, like a deer hair. Sorry, I'm thinking like North American species. Um, but oftentimes you can't do that because there's maybe not that much there, but it also is not necessarily representative of everything the animal ate. So that's why genetic analysis is also really useful for diet. So in terms of, do people, do, do leopards, for example, do specific breeds or, or specific uh, mammals have like, okay, they eat 80% of the time they eat this specific thing. And you pick that up by doing this sort of like, I don't know, uh, exponential thing where you, you, you multiply the DNA by some number and say, yes, it, it's 80% that thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, oh, I see what you're saying. Sorry. So like if you um, basically take a scat sample and you sequence the DNA of everything that's in there, so like you can use um, universal markers that amplify like the mitochondrial region of a lot of different species. So like obviously if you don't know what's in there, how do you know to use the tools? Like if I don't know that there is yeah. blue ibet or blue sheep in this fecal sample, how do I know to use a marker that's blue sheep specific? Is it, do you do machine learning at all where you run various machine learning algorithms saying, I think it's this thing and I'll train it on this database and it must be? Not at this level, not for the wet lab work. So like what I'm describing is like the wet lab work. You can do machine learning for analyses once you have like the raw data analyzed, but like for the wet lab work to generate the raw data, you wouldn't, at least to my knowledge, you wouldn't use that. Okay. But you can see what's basically you take like a universal primer that amplifies that basically you blast, you basically you do a blast, it's called a blast search. Like that's literally the database. So you basically like you have your extracted DNA, you hope it's a lot, you hope it's not leopard, but maybe it's like, you know, red fox, which happens to be the problem a lot of the time. And you basically, but you know that you're gonna get a lot of uh, prey DNA. So you would use a universal primer that amplifies the distinct mitochondrial regions for a lot of different species. So you're going to amplify, you're going to sequence it. So you're going to get all of these rows of individual base pair variation. It's going to be like from individuals, but you don't know what it is. So you have to input all that data into a blast search. And that's a computer system that aligns your different DNA with known DNA from other species. So basically I can take like one wow. scat and I sequence it. Uh, using a, a, a universal primer and it maybe I'll get like nine different species back. So I put it into the system, it aligns it with other species and it will say, okay, you have a 99% match with, you know, yellow bellied or with marmot or a, you know, 98% match with blue sheep for all of these different species. So then you can know in this one sample with, you know, 98, 99% accuracy, I've identified the five different species that this animal ate. Wow. And so that's really useful from a conservation perspective as well as like, you know, diet 
is really important. And because of this type of technology, we know that snow leopards really like to eat marmots. We know that snow, you know, snow leopards really specialize on blue sheep and, you know, ibex and markhor in different parts of their range, which is really, really cool. So taking a step back, what is your like biggest dream slash goal for doing this? So my, I think about, I tend to think about conservation and wildlife in terms of genetics, like exclusively, like I'm interested in, if you like, just picture a map of like your state, wherever you live in the world, picture a map of that state, figure, figure out the outline, think about the topography, like where are the major mountains, where are there any major rivers, are there a lot of cities, like if you can picture some type of map of the landscape in which you live, what does that mean to wildlife? Not just from a like today and tomorrow, how do they move, but what does it mean in terms of how populations are structured? And so like I'm interested in identifying spatial patterns. Like every landscape has a pattern. Like you have landscape landscape composition, like what is the percentage of like forest? What is the percentage of urbanization, the percentage of agriculture? And then you have configuration, like how is that arranged? Is is suitable habitat all connected or is it really like splotted out and disjointed like for example that's a problem with tigers in a lot of the range like in particular in particular in parts of india we have all these small clusters of habitat that tigers can be successful in but there's no way for them to get to one another without traversing through really hostile landscape where that often results in them getting killed a smaller example is you've got, you know, you've got species of wildlife on either side of a major highway. They can, you know, they can seed on, succeed on both sides of the highway, but it's really dangerous. It's really costly to cross that highway. And so, like, I think about those types of questions from a genetic perspective, because basically when an animal breeds, they're taking their genes with them. Right. And so that's how we kind of understand how animals over long periods of time are uh, perceiving and navigating their landscape. And that's really important because like most of the world is human dominated and conservation is yes about populations, but you can't manage populations without protecting their ecosystems. But where the hell are their ecosystems and how are they connected? And those are the types of big questions that genetics, genetics is one tool that we can use to try to answer some of those problems. And so like that's basic, that's how I try to think about just wildlife. That's most of kind of like how my brain works in terms of like if I see wildlife, I'm wondering how are they connected across these landscapes. Okay, so if you were to say, or if you were to define your dream job after grad school, you have all of the resources in the world, where would you go? What would you do? How would you do it? I think that like my main interest is probably working for, I want to do research. Like I, so for me, like I want to be able to answer questions. Like I really am, I really, um, I get excited by the scientific process. So like, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm like the best scientist. Like I, I, I'm not very good at statistics and like R makes me want to pull my hair out. And I feel really <laughs> self-conscious like a lot, you know, like everybody has an inferiority complex, but like, I'm no exception to that. Like I definitely have deficiencies. Um, you know, in terms of the things that I can or can't do. Um, but the, all of that being said, like, I'm still really interested in, like, the scientific process. I'm just not, like, I, I feel like that qualifier is important because when people say, oh, I love the scientific process, it makes yeah. you sound like you're, like, this really, like, one-track-minded, like, genius, and that is just very much not the case. Yeah. Um, I just really like that process, though, and for me, being able to have a job where I can focus on research is really important, not because... I care about um, only publishing, like, you know, in academia, we hear about like publisher parish, or we hear about issues, um, or we hear about people that are like sitting in their ivory towers doing their science. I don't really want to do that. I really just want to be able to answer questions in a meaningful way. And for me, the meaningful way through which I do that is combining um, like rigorous science, which for me is like genetics research, but also working with people. And so you know, conservation can't get done without good questions, which requires science. But on the flip side, none of that matters if you don't have a connection with the people that live alongside wildlife. Right. You know, like I know a decent amount about snow leopards, um, but I don't know nearly as much as the people that live alongside them. So it's really important to not just like take their opinions, but have, you know, like these Tibetan herders or these, um, you know, Kyrgyz herders, like they are equal stakeholders in the process. Like they are equally important to that process. And for me, 
like my dream job would allow me to be able to continue to do what I'm effectively doing now, which is trying to do some field work where I can, or informing people who uh, are doing field work on the ground already that are doing important work, how to include genetics in their efforts such that we can try to fill in these gaps that we have about conservation questions, whether it's just like what we don't know this or can we use the answer to this question in a meaningful way that helps conservation, particularly because snow leopards, you know, traverse across different countries. It's like, you know, these boundary lines don't mean anything to them. But when you have states and uh, regions managing this cat differently, but these pop one population covers like two different countries. If there's disjointedness in the way things are managed, it's not necessarily going to be helpful. If so you don't how have does that, that work in real time? I mean, you let's say you fly into Kazakhstan. I'm drinking my cocktail now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I very much switched to whiskey because I, I was like, all right, I'm ready. Um, yeah, how do you how do you manage? I mean, I'm sure that there are various regulations in specific countries, and again, I don't. I mean. I had come from a very different perspective where I look up there. And so right. there are, you know, different countries that sort of align in various ways of saying, you know, we all agree that we're right. going to treat this some way. I would imagine right. it's very different for adjacent countries and how they treat various wildlife that is indigenous to that area. Is that right? Right. And no, and, that, and that's, you know, you're totally correct. Um, fortunately for snow leopards, there is um, the Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Protection Program. It's called GSLEP, it's like Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem oh, Protection okay. Program. And that's where like all of the 12 range countries, their, their leaders of government have gotten together for basically meetings about snow leopards to say, this is a charismatic species that all of our countries care about. It's important to our culture. It's important to faith in some parts of the world. Um, it's, it's important to these ecosystems. Yeah. How can we work together to protect this cat? And so, you know, there are targeted objectives around this program um, that are where basically governments and organizations are working together. So like I work with a US-based NGO called Panthera. And so, you know, it's US-based. They're a nonprofit. They only do wildcat research, including snow leopards. Um, but it's 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 all the big cats. They have a lot. Of, they have a small cat program for the do a lot of really cool work. Um, and and part of their structure is working with researchers in all of these different countries on different projects for different species. And so you know, Panthera is you know funding my dissertation research um because we're interested in connecting all of these different experts like wow. i'm certainly not, i'm not even a leading expert i'm not the only expert but basically getting all of these like-minded people together and using all of our different like resources the available That's databases amazing. we have as well as the expertise to try to say what are some of the questions that we don't have answers to and how can we work together creatively to act to actually answer them and so like me, for me, like from a professional standpoint, being able to do that is really, really important to me. And so like, hopefully like working with a nonprofit, like a research agency, you know, like, you know, like was like Wildlife Conservation Society or like Panthera or um, something that's comparable that does this type of work would be really satisfying for me. That's amazing. I'm okay. And someone asked the question, I feel like it's relevant to like pivot to this. Someone said, what's it like going through customs with a bunch of cat poop? Um, that's a great question. It is a great question. So the the to back up in terms of regulations, so CITES permits um, are required in order to transfer certain types of biological material. And so like CITES, um, it, let me make sure I have the have the acronym right. It's the Convention on Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species and for like wildlife. And so like you can't just like cross you know borders and countries with like material from endangered species and there's lots of different regulation regulate like regulations surrounding that and so like you can't just cross these borders or like leave the country with like blood or tissue but it's a whole different matter for fecal material so like i you know i deal in poop and like in the united states for example like i don't have to apply for a permit from u.s fish and wildlife to get uh, fecal material imported do you ever, when you go through customs, do you ever have to be like, yeah, my job is, is poop? So I haven't had problems, but I, I have been lucky. So like I came, I came back from Kyrgyzstan in the fall with about 160 samples. I put it in my checked bag. Holy um, shit. Thankfully, I didn't get like pulled at customs and, you know, cause they always have drug dogs and the thing about like yeah. scat samples, it smells really bad. <laughs> Imagine. Like, 
And oh my now God. The time where I'm doing show and tell. And so like before my university got shut down, I got sent some samples and I'm going to put them back in the freezer here soon. Um, I had a colleague send me, so this is snow leopard poop, you guys. Wait, put it, put it closer, put it closer. So what you're looking at, sorry, is like a 50 uh, ml tube that has desiccant. So these little beads are the little beads that you see in shoes. They're like these little statchets and their wow. job is to absorb moisture. And so what, and on top of that is the actual fecal material right there. So like this is like a subsample of a snow leopard poop from Pakistan. That is so, so cool. Most of these would be in a lab freezer, but I got one of my colleagues mailed these to me right at the time my university shut down. So I couldn't take them to campus. So they're currently sitting in my freezer. Oh my God. And so there's a little, it's not, so usually you wouldn't see any moisture at all, but the reason you're seeing moisture is because these samples were stored in ethanol. So there's two different ways to really store fecal material. Like when it comes to feces, it's not contained, like people think it's contaminated because it's like shit, right? <laughs> but this is like this is this is biology gold like this is the currency that i work in so i want to protect it and the way that i do that is you moisture is the enemy when it comes to dna you moisturize moisture the is the enemy you don't want any more like i want moisture on my face i do not want it on my poop <laughs> Get it on my tombstone, guys. Like i don't <laughs> want it on i want it on my face not on my poop and All so right. that's why we use these desiccant beads because these these silica uh, uh, desiccant or dry right beads, they literally leach moisture out of the fecal sample. Wow. And that, and the DNA remains preserved as long as it's at a stable temperature. So like room temperature, as long as it's dry is okay. Freezing is better. Really, really cold freezing is the best. Um, but ethanol but can also be the same like thing. Normal freezer? Like where do you, where do so you? So currently, and this is just in my normal freezer, like at home, like it stays in another bag, but it's like next to like my frozen strawberries. <laughs> I don't know if like that should be documented, but I've also had a lot of worse stuff in my freezer. I used to have, I used to, um, so during my master's, I worked on bobcats and I would, um, I did a lot of mammalogy stuff. So I really wanted to have like some skulls. And I had this one fur trapper that just like kept giving me bobcat skulls. I was like, I'm not a big fan of fur trapping at all, but that's how I got my material. I didn't want to be rude. Right. So they're like, here's a bunch of bobcat skulls and also some like shark fins, would you like to have it? What? Yeah, it was a weird time. It's Texas. Um, and so I took these, yeah. uh, you know, I have a bobcat skull, which I've used like for educational display. So like it wasn't all in vain, but I did have a bobcat skull that stayed in my freezer for a while. And like one, like, yeah, yeah, I pack my lunch, you know, like I'm, I'm frugal. I don't make a lot of money. So I'm not like buying lunch every day. It's like I pack my lunch. I'll take like a freezer pack. And on one day, like I took my lunch and like opened my lunch box and I was like, something is not right. And like, I roll, I open my lunch up and I roll, like, I like, I usually keep some of my freezer packs in like plastic bags because they sweat. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also like I had like this bobcat skull in like three plastic bags and I had mistakenly grabbed the bobcat skull yeah. instead of my ice pack. So I have like, you know, like a tuna salad in like my little like, you know, lunchbox or whatever. And I'm like, why does it smell so bad? And I like open up and I like peel back the layers of the plastic bag and there's just like a dead- Oh my God. <laughs> It was a whole thing. It's fine. <laughs> I didn't eat my lunch. I could have, but I didn't. So, you know, I keep these in my freezer. They're like triple bagged. Um, right now I'm taking just to, for those of you that are curious, like I'm sitting them on ice because like you wanted to keep this temperature relatively stable. Um, if they're not stored like Wait, in a freezer, like, hold it up to the like, maybe like you can kind of see how it's like literally ice cubes from my freezer. It's starting to sweat a little bit, but like the, the samples are totally safe. It. But the samples also can be stored in ethanol, which is you know you want to have like eighty or ninety percent ethanol. Um, you can store them. You can store your fecal material in ethanol um, in order to prevent like degradation of the DNA as well. And so my colleague who sent me these samples their lab was storing them in ethanol. So she poured off the ethanol and put them in desiccant to send them to me. But because I got them late, I don't have like a lab freezer. So they're just hanging out in my freezer with my strawberries. <laughs> my life's weird. My God. I like cannot parse all of this. Sorry. I'm, I'm wow. Um, okay. So what is also, you need to catch up to me because I've kind of been chugging whiskey in the background, but okay. I'm there. I'm getting there. Okay. This is beer, but that's whiskey. I, I approve. Big time. This is great. Um, what is your, do you have a favorite story from being in the field or from being in lab or like a funny 
what is something that is stuck out in your mind? Either like, this is, I'm so happy I'm doing this. It can be that, or it can be, I'm doing something hilarious and I'm literally picking up poop and I, that's my job. And this is awesome. Like, what is something that has stuck out in your mind from your own um, experience? I guess two stories that kind of like typify my life. Like I really do deal in cat poop. That's kind of like the bulk of my job. And I started doing that. So I did a, an internship at the Smithsonian in 2010. I was a, the end of college. Was in DC? It what? Was it in New York or DC or? It was in DC. So actually, sorry, it was in Front Royal, Virginia. So the Smithsonian, there's a Smithsonian Zoo and then there's a Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, which is effectively a research and breeding facility for their captive wildlife for species survival programs, which is separate from the Tiger King stuff. Wow. I know we've got some questions. I got to get to that. Um, but I was the clouded leopard intern. And so clouded leopards don't breed well in captivity. They have a lot of aggression issues. Um, like everything will be fine. Like, you know, their courtship, like they're having drinks, they're getting to know one another, everyone's fine. And all of a sudden, like someone's missing a leg or their throat gets ripped out. Like it's real serious. Like it's just, it's, it's way worse than anything you could experience on tender. It's just not a good time. <laughs> and so like the Smithsonian is interesting. Like, so the next step is if they don't naturally breed in captivity, you want to try artificial insemination where necessary. Like, and so like for those of you that watch my thread on Tiger King, this does this is separate from private exploitative breeding. So this is controlled breeding with no individuals of known pedigree for species survival plans. And so that's what we were working on. The whole purpose of a species survival plan is to safeguard the existence of the species should species, should populations in the wild basically go extinct. Can I, sorry, can I ask a quick yeah, question? Go ahead. This is, and this, I'm asking as a scientist, but also someone who does not do this, this is funded by the NSF or some sort of like credited, agency or is this a private thing? I don't know. So it's not a private thing. I'm not sure all of the different funding agencies like so like obviously like the a, the species survival plans have stud books and they're experts that manage that. And so like AZA accreditation takes that into account, but I'm not sure who the Okay. I'm not yeah, I'm not sure who the governing or funding bodies are. Okay. okay. Um so basically when it comes down to that works like if an animal like within an SSP is not you have to figure out how to like make how do you like reproduce animals in a responsible way and so the Smithsonian in this case like clouded leopards don't do great breeding naturally tigers bam they breed really well naturally like, they're like they're doing it they're having fun they're making babies that's why it's so easy it's for people like, like Joe Exotic just like inherent sex drive that makes them do I don't know it's that but it's also like it has to do with like stress hormones and how they respond in captivity so like you see in tiger in tiger king like tigers seeming really friendly and they're greeting their humans like it's called a shuffle they go like it's, a, it's like this weird like I'm not doing it. I'd probably look like an idiot but it's, like, it's called a shuffle it's like a type sound and like that's how they say hey yo what's up like how's your day been and they do that to humans and so like I spent a lot of my time at the tiger sanctuary going, which means like what up in tiger, but like, so they're like a little more relaxed in captivity. I mean, even like we saw a lot of shit in tiger king, but ultimately when they're younger, like the tigers can like adapt in a, in a, in some way, like it's still not a good scenario. We're still seeing, uh, we're still seeing interaction. It's not based on natural history or ecology or behavior. It's not good. But the, the example that I'm trying to make, or the, the point that I'm trying to make is that they handle captivity a little bit better than like some other species and the clouded leopards just don't seem to do that well like they have you know uh heightened stress hormones but the males also have really really amped up testosterone so when it comes to breeding they can like switch on a dime so like courtship's going great they're vibing one another and all of a sudden like light switch goes off and he's like i'm gonna rip your face off i mean it's just a weird scenario so because natural breeding doesn't work the next step is artificial insemination right but unfortunately, artificial insemination, which is effectively inserting a straw of semen into the vaginal canal of a female to impregnate her, that doesn't work well either for clouded leopards. And my job, the internship that I did was trying to figure out what is the next step. So it goes like natural breeding, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, because wow. that's like a little bit more like it's obviously more invasive, right. it's more involved. And it's like my job was looking at hormone cycles in clouded leopards, because when it comes to in vitro fertilization, like if those of you maybe if you're a human and you've either done IVF or you know someone who has, the reason they get shots is because they're trying to basically restart your hormone cycle 
which in, in women the, or in females, the hormone cycle is, 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 you know, peaks and lows of like estrogen and progesterone, which maintain, um, is it like monthly dollars. for most species or is it, sorry, I just slurred my word. No, it's, it's not. So like, it's in terms of like, um, um, like, so like cyclicity in humans, like, you know, humans, like human women, some women have a monthly bleeding cycle. Um, or I'm sorry, some humans have a bleeding cycle. It's not just women. Some people right. bleed and we bleed like generally every 28 days. Um, other animals, that doesn't happen. Um, cats are induced ovulators, meaning so they don't ovulate, which is separate from bleeding. When you bleed, it's shedding the uterine right. lining to prepare the uterus for a pregnancy like during the next cycle. So you right. have follicles that grow, they basically burst, that ovary drops down the fallopian tube, hopefully sperm and fer fertilizes it, and then it travels down to the uterus. Um, in, in, in humans, that ovulation occurs every 20, every 28, on a 28 day cycle. But in cats, they're induced ovulators, meaning they have to actually have physical intercourse in order for that egg to drop down into the fallopian tube. And so that's part of the process, but still understanding like how those hormones work was really important. And so that's the job that I did when I was at Smithsonian. And I already forgot the original question because I got really hyped up about hormones. I'm too drunk to honestly understand. Like the I hormones are cool. And basically my, oh yeah, the question was cool science stories. And the reason that I said all that is because like my job, this was my first foray into the world of poop. Oh, great. Entire job. So you can, you can identify DNA from poop, but you can also uh, get an, an, an idea about like hormone um, concentration from fecal material. So I did this whole internship for three months where my only job was to take like frozen cat poop and bang it wow. with a mallet. I just banged cat poop with a mallet into fine powder. And then you took that powder and put it through a boiling process to extract hormone concentrations. So you can understand not, I mean, it sounds like you can understand a variety of things from poop, which is amazing. It's true. You actually understand menstruation cycles or hormone fluctuations by analyzing poop. It's cool. That's why poop is the best. Okay. Sorry, do you need a time series to understand hormone fluctuations or is it, can you get all of that data from one sample? You would need a time series. So like okay. it would be like, uh, you know, this was uh, her hormone concentration at this time, but you would need several samples. So that's why in a captive setting, they were collecting samples every single day. Yeah. To try to understand how their hormones go up and down in blood, like your um, stress hormone, like cortisol levels change like every 15 minutes. There's like a study from like the nineties where the, like anesthetized lions somewhere in Africa and were like taking blood like every 15 minutes or something when they were having them, they were knocked down to be radio collared, I think. And they were tracking like cortisol or stress hormones throughout that to see like, obviously they were stressed from the human interaction, how long before that registers in their blood. It's like, there's a lot of different like time uh, periods, but like um, in feces, it I think reflects your hormone concentrations from like 48 hours before. So it's not like instantaneous because obviously like the feces develops and it passes through your system and it collects information as it moves. So it's not instantaneous like blood. But the reason I mentioned all that, the whole bunny trail for that was to say that like, I basically spent three months pounding cat shit with a mallet into sand. And I spent like every day <laughs> in the shower cleaning cat shit out of like the curvature of my ears. What? Every single day. No. And can I tell you a secret that I've never yes. told anybody? I'm going to tell oh, all of you that are watching. So I did this internship. Right. Yes. Job. Like it was, they provided housing. Like I had my car, I could go get groceries and stuff. In the three months that I was there, three months, and some of you are just going to like log off and not speak to me. In three months, like every day, I'm like, damn, I still got like cat shit. Like I've got like clouded leopard shit in my ears. I did not go buy Q tips. <laughs> <laughs> So like, I don't know what, like, you know, I'm talking about just like the outer edge of my ear, right? Like, I don't know what this is called, but like, I'm not like in there digging. Like, I don't know, like how, this is like 10 years ago, how much clouded leopard shit is still in my ears? I don't know. So I'm that's right. Kind of, that's, so we're just, just manually, every time you were like touching your ear, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's more shit. That's definitely, now I've got cat shit under my fingernails. So I, basically that's one weird story about me, but the other story that's much cooler than that is that, I mean, um, I went to China last year um, to basically volunteer with one of our collaborating organizations um, that does really phenomenal uh, snow leopard research and wild cat research. And I went to the coolest place in the entire world. It's called the Valley of the Cats. Where? That's literally what Where it's called. It? It's, so it's located on the Tibetan Plateau, which is in like South, 
South Central China. It's a, like the nearest town is called Yushu and it's a Tibetan autonomous region, which means there's a lot of people that uh, are Tibetan Buddhists in that part of the world. And so there's a lot of people that are Tibetan herders. And so they live, you know, part of the year is relatively nomadic and they live alongside the, this wildlife and this beautiful valley is essentially like pristine snow leopard habitat. And so, you know, it's, it's considered like the best habitat in snow leopard range. Um, they have uh, brown bears, they've got common leopards, they've got snow leopards, they've got wolves, or they've got palace cats, uh, Chinese uh, mountain cats. I think they've got lynx. They've got all these suite of carnivores. And it's like the coolest thing in the world. And I was just going there to like volunteer on their project and to learn about like did what they're doing. Did you see all of these animals? I didn't. So I saw, I did see wolves. Um, but the coolest thing is like people who see, we've got a lot of people that study snow leopards and they're very difficult to see. So like you can go to a lot of places where, you know, there was a snow leopard yesterday. They have large home ranges, they're secretive. You just don't see them. Um, but when I was in China this past July, I saw four snow leopards. Holy shit. In two weeks. Oh my God. Yeah. And so oh, why? I mean, every time I saw a snow leopard was like the coolest like experience of my life. But I have to say like the coolest moment so we saw two, we saw one snow leopard twice, um, and it, it was a week apart. How do you know it was the same? Was it tagged or how do? You... No, just like looking at her face. If you look at the photos, comparing, you can tell it's in you know, the same you animal. And it's, photos, you can show us. I uh, I probably do. I'll, uh, while I'm talking, right. I'm gonna like appear that I'm not paying attention to you guys, but I'm gonna try to find this photo. It's also on my Twitter, but I will totally share it while I'm talking. So, so how did this happen in two weeks? I mean, was it where you guys were? Or... It's where we were, and it's considered a really popular. Um, not popular. There's a really high density of snow leopards in this part of their range. Um, and Did basically you know that going into it, is that why you chose that? Area? I know. So like our collaborators work there and I knew that it was a possibility that we would be able like, if I was going to see a snow leopard ever seeing one in the Valley of the cats is very likely because so many people see them like the herders see them on a regular basis. And I'm still looking for that photo just while we're talking. Um, actually I'll probably pull it up on my colleague's website. Um, and so basically we were looking for snow leopards this one day and it had snowed. It's July, like it's, you know, not that cold, but then we woke up one morning to snow and, um, we went out to this one area where they had seen snow leopards previously. Can I, and sorry. No, go ahead. Does the environment, I don't, I literally know nothing about snow leopards. Does snow make them like more easily come out or how does that like, so, kind of, so snow leopards are high elevation mountain specialists. And what that means is that they live at high elevation. They live in these mountain ranges that are above like 10, typically 10,000 feet and up. So like anywhere from like 10,000 to 20,000 feet in elevation. Right. Um, okay. And so they generally live above tree line and they are specialists, meaning that they are uniquely adapted to snowy ecosystem. They live on okay. really rugged terrain. And they have this really thick double coat of fur, which makes them well suited to just being totally cool with really cold environments and a lot of snow. Okay. They also obviously blend into their environment. Um, as a result, they are not well adapted to really hot environments. And so like we saw a snow leopard, the, one of the stories I was gonna say, we saw this snow leopard charge down the mountain um, one day. Whoa. It was, you know, in the middle of July, it wasn't snowing that day. It was like 55 degrees and she was hot. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show the screen really quickly. So this is the cat in question. Can oh my God, it? beautiful. So this is a female snow leopard. This is the second time that I saw her. She is on a mountainside and it's obviously all green. It is covered in, in, in wildflowers. And she just, we, we, um, one of my colleagues had seen her like 500 meters away and I didn't see her. Like I look at my, with my binoculars and I didn't catch her. So I was really disappointed. And so we decided to just like sit and wait to see if we would spot her. And we had the, we heard marmots, like marmots are these like large body, uh, rodents that, um, they're really social animals. And like so many species like birds, they do warning calls when there are predators around, they're trying to warn their friends. They go, beep, beep. Like, here's a marmot he loses his shit. Right. See, they lose. Yeah. And so the so, marmots in kind also will lose their mind if they know a predator is near. And so they will just like sit up on their back legs and just alarm calls. Like a, eep, eep, eep. 
eh, type sound. Like it's horrible. It's or it's 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 fine. It sounds kind of awful when you're up close. It sounds as annoying as the sound it's, that I just it's made. It's super high pitch. It's, it's very high pitch and it carries and it's and the purpose of that is to let other individuals in burrows that are like two four hundred meters away hear right. it. And so we that's really helpful if you're looking for carnivores because if you know a car like there might be a predator nearby if everybody is like signaling. So you generally will look in the direction of what you're hearing. And so in this case, we sat, we sat down with our binoculars on this road overlooking this mountain. So we're separated by a river, so we're not very close. Like this photo that I'm getting, that this photo was taken from like 300 meters away, it's just in the zoom. Um, so like we weren't close at all, just for the record. That's important to say because you don't want to get too close to harass wildlife, right? And so in this case, we decided to stay because we noticed that like a marmot was alarm calling. He's just like looking up the mountain, just standing there and just, you know, calling repeatedly. And we're like, okay, we know that it's July because it's July. We know that this female, if she got pregnant at the beginning of the year, she has kittens on the ground, which means it is hunting around the clock to try to meet the needs of those kittens. She's got to like take care of herself so she can produce enough milk for these kittens that are probably like five or six weeks old. And so we sat there for like 20 minutes and we were just getting ready to pack up. And I looked up at my binoculars one time and just out of nowhere, man, like this snow leopard had been like 500 meters away and nobody had seen her. Like it's all grass and rocks. We've been scouring the whole mountainside for like 30 minutes. We had not seen her move at all. All of a sudden she just like exploded out of nowhere, like directly in front of me, like, okay, she's like 300 meters away, but she's in directly in front of my line of sight. And she just exploded down she the mountain. Was going, she was hunting something? She was hunting. She So the marmot that was calling, she was after the marmot. So she had basically oh, like shit. gone like 500 meters and we didn't see her. And she had, you know, crouched down and she had run down. Like you can't see it in the photo, oh but like next, next to this photo, there was like a little like a recess, like a scar in the mountain where like water had washed away all of like the vegetation and like this little like it was like a, it was like a nature slide of dirt kind of she just like exploded and came charging down the hill like right for a marmot and just I mean I have never seen she cut like she had covered like 15 feet before my brain said snow leopard wow it was I mean and she was like literally like 300 meters away or 300 feet away guys like it was I, you know, you see, you, you, you see videos and you learn about it. And I've been, I've been, I'm in the third year, I'm in the fourth year of my PhD, you know, so like I, I'm immersed in snow leopards. And like, I just seeing this cat was like the coolest thing that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And she flattened herself against the flowers, like what you're looking at. She like flattened herself like this and she just disappeared. And we're like, where did the snow leopard go? Well, she was like right in front of us and we cannot see her. And all of a sudden she exploded out over the, over the wildflowers and just charged across the grass and just like tried to get this marmot. Like she tried to throw her body on top of him, but the marmot was standing over his burrow. And so he just like, you know, bloop, like dropped down into his burrow and she like do dove down into the burrow with him, but she didn't get him. And so what? this photo, what this photo that you're seeing is about like three or four minutes after that like unsuccessful hunt. Holy so it was like, oh my God. This it was like wild. 55 degrees. She was hot. She was panting and she just, she was pissed. She's frustrated. Her, her tail was just flicking back and forth. She turned around. She looked at us and she just sat down. And so this is not a park. This is not like a Yosemite situation or like, or I'm sorry, like a Yellowstone situation where like they see people all the time. They see yeah. people because they live alongside these herders, but she just didn't give a shit. She was like, I got stuff to do. I know you're there. There's a river separating us. I, I have bigger things to worry about than you. And she just sat there for like five minutes, catching her breath. And then she just walked away. And she just like walked across the wildflowers and just disappeared the way she had come. And it was, uh, it will forever be the coolest experience that I have ever had. I don't know how you will top it. It oh was, oh my God. It was a true testament to, how important um, human wildlife tolerance is. So, you know, these, these Tibetan Buddhists are really tolerant of these snow leopards. They live alongside them. They don't harass them. They don't uh, kill them. It's so part of their can you talk a little bit about how they live alongside them safely? How does that work? Yeah, so snow leopards are not, so we hear about big cats and like, you know, lions and tigers being man eaters. Um, and we've seen episodes, we've seen like evidence in like the news where you've got like starving mountain lions will like attack people, right? 
And so that happens, but snow leopards are very small. So snow leopards are the smallest of the big cat, five cats or the five big cats. So in terms of size, it's tiger, lion, leopard, jaguar, snow leopard. Um, and so they're the smallest. They are, as a result, they're just, their whole demeanor is not as like in your face aggressive as like a tiger or a lion might be, or like a jaguar. I mean, they're all dangerous. They can yeah. hurt you. Like a snow leopard, if a snow leopard wanted to kill me, a snow leopard could kill me. But like these herders, they're not naturally aggressive. They're not going to like stalk you and kill you. Most predators aren't going to anyways. That's the people that like hype up like, oh my God, we have to kill all of the wolves because the wolves are going to kill us. Like that's just bullshit, man. Like it's just not like you don't need to hide your kids. You don't need to hide your wife. Like it's not like that. It's not that level of dangerous except for the individual cases when it is like the man, the man eating lions of Sabo or like the few time, the, the few individuals in India that do decide to pursue humans as prey like that happens yeah. but like it's yeah. individual behavior not like trends across like an individual like a species or population right so snow leopards are not as big they're not a threat to humans obviously where humans and wildlife coexist you have conflict so when with regards to like livestock that's a problem in the u.s it's also a problem in central asia you have these nomadic herders that like their livelihood is based on how many yak they have per year and snow leopards will sometimes kill yak um Obviously, that do, there is some like retaliation in certain parts of the world where like if a snow leopard kills livestock, they want to go out and kill the snow leopard to er eradicate the threat. And realistically, you can't, you know, it, we don't want to hear about snow leopards dying, but right. you also have to understand that if you only have like 25 yak and you lose two of them, your, your survival is, is imperiled as a result of that. So in parts of the world where you hear about like local people killing wildlife, you it, it's you can't immediately vilify them for that because you have to understand the context like yeah. the context some of these people live on like two dollars a day like right. so a, 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 a snow leopard killing an animal might really really matter and so that's why like different organizations like snow leopard trust or panthera have these like programs where they try to help empower the communities whether that's generating like ecotourism that where like you know funds are ba like basically you have financial incentive to not kill snow leopards or you have programs that are put into place that basically create like insurance policies where like if your someone in your community loses like sheep or yak to a snow leopard you have this um insurance policy to pay them for the loss of that animal That's so awesome. they are compensated and the snow leopard is able to live alongside that you're trying to do things like you know proper like uh, uh corralling practices to like mitigate those threats but Buddhas, like in, in this part of the world, like uh, Buddha, like the Tibetan Buddhists, like part of their faith involves wildlife tolerance and like the snow leopard is revered in their faith. And I don't want to speak on that because I'm not an expert, but there is a lot of tolerance for that species. And, you know, in addition to all of these assurances and their understanding like snow leopard's place in the world and them trying to mitigate those threats, they have a unique tolerance for this cat, even when the cat occasionally depredates on some of their livestock. And so as a result, you have this really beautiful ecosystem that is ultimately pristine because people live alongside, alongside wildlife in an ethical way, in an understanding and flexible way. That's not just like, we got to kill them because they're like, you know, taking some of our elk right. or something. And so like, it's a really, really, it's just like a magical place. Like I, you know, the Valley of the Cast sounds magical and it really does reflect you know, the, 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 the beauty of the place and, and the fact that Snow Leopard like looked at us and was like, I'm fine. I know you're there, but I'm not like super threatened. I'm not going to run away indicates that she has had some, probably had some interaction and like they left her alone. She left them alone. Were you surprised by that when you saw it? I really was because I figured most sightings would be super fleeting and really far away. And we saw a couple cats, like we rounded a corner one day and literally I was on the wrong side of the van, so I didn't see it as closely as my colleagues, but this snow leopard, it was a female, she was lactating. She had come down from the mountain to the river to drink. And so we rounded the corner in our van and she was literally like, she had either just drank or was coming to drink, but she was standing on the edge of the road, which was a hill. And it was literally like three feet up. So it was like eye level with us. So like we round the corner and there's like a snow leopard like right there. So oh like we, my God. we immediately, got, it was a different snow leopard than the one in that photo. And so she got, we got out of the vehicle and like put our binoculars up and she like walked up the hill because she wasn't comfortable because it was literally like the vehicle was 10 feet from her. Like we could have like reached out and like wow. touched her. 
Wow. Um, and so we didn't do that, obviously, but like she hiked up a little bit and was like, I'm not really that comfortable, but she kept turning around and looking at us. And finally, we have this video of her, like she's looking at us, she knows we're there. And then she's just like walking along this rock, like scent marking. So she's like, you know, lifting her tail and she's, you know, spraying urine on the back of, of this rock to like mark her territory. And she's just like, all right, like I'm at a comfortable distance. Like I'm not running away. I'm not coming to see you because I'm not that interested, but like, I'm here, I'm cool. I'm going to do my own thing. And so like, I wasn't experience, expecting that at all because like all, most of my wildlife encounters, everyone's like, get the fuck out. Like I'm not yeah. interested. Like oh, we yeah. don't want to out. Like we're not friends. I don't like you, which is why the shit in tiger keen is so frustrating because everyone's like, oh my God, these tigers are like purring and they're saying hi, they must love us. Then yes, like, uh-uh, no, like they have no interest in being our friends and they don't need us at all. And so it was surprising to see that a wild animal is like, all right, like I respect, I'm going to respect your boundary. Like you're a carnivore, you're a predator. I'm a predator. We're just going to be over here. We're cool. So and that's what it should be. this may be totally so ridiculous question, but has your treatment of your own pets or your own sort of interactions with dogs, cats, birds, snakes, whatever that are domesticated changed based on your own research and your own presence in the field? I think it's a good question because I think that like, so, you know, I've had like cats, I grew up with cats and I like getting the dog that I have now, like his one year adoptive anniversary is next week. So this is like my first oh, foray geez. into, his, this is like my first foray into like keeping a dog alive. I had dogs growing up, but like, I, I haven't had a dog since I was like maybe 14. Oh, well, my parents have dogs, but like, so I've grown up with dogs, but like I haven't owned one myself. Dog. Yeah. Um, I think that like after seeing different behavior I definitely understand so actually no let me let me back up a little bit let me I'll answer the dog question I definitely think that my cats are very socialized because I understand feel feeling behavior so like everyone always says that cat like you're either a cat person or you're a dog person because like cats aren't like cats don't love you and they're not friendly and yes I am like sub commenting to my sister who's like I don't understand cats cats don't love you yes Elise they love me anyways Honestly, that is kind of me I'm I this is a disclaimer that I have not publicized I genuinely think that cats hate me like I okay so I they pick up on my anxiety yeah they're really so that's the thing is cats and dogs are the same in that they are so their social structure is slightly different but both species are very sociable even solitary yeah. cats like mountain lions are known to share kills with one another. Like we're not related, but I'm going to give you some of my deer because my, I'm going to let you come in and feed when I'm feeding, because my hope is in two months when I haven't eaten in three weeks, you will also share your kill with me. Yeah. And so these animals are like, they have social complexities that we don't actually understand cats included. And so like my, like I got my cats like right around the time that I was um, interning, like right before I was interning at the tiger sanctuary and like seeing how they interact and just don't, you don't, don't, you don't need to treat cats differently than dogs. I think, and that's, I think my problem is I was never raised around cats. And so right. I, I have a very hard time adjusting around them because well, they're, they're, you know, they can be squirrely and they can be weird and they're biting, they're ouchy, you know, they, they're sharp in a lot more places <laughs> than dogs are, you know what I mean? It's like, it's definitely. Makes sense. No, I know. <laughs> and so like cats, like if you raise a cat to be like, oh, you don't like it, obviously cats are peculiar. Like I was talking about bobcats, like they have bad attitudes, like they're doing stuff in their own terms. Like, I'm yeah. Being, yeah, don't touch that, please. I have a cat that's like, oh, this is so over poop. What is this? Um, Tom, come here. If you treat a cat like a dog, they will respond very similarly to dogs. Like they're social animals. And so like I raised raised my cats with the understanding that like even though they have peculiarities, it's not necessarily like species specific. And so like they're not necessarily as like uh, solitary or like easily spooked as people might think. Um, and the same with dogs. Like, I feel like I approach it from like a more critical mindset. Like, you know, why do they do the things that they do? Like, I want to read more about it versus making human assumptions because like, yes, we always wrong. Like there's like, I have no, I don't understand why my dog is terrified of this one like corner in my house. Yep. No. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think <laughs> it's because he's an idiot, but realistically, like he's got his own reasons and I got to figure out how to combat that based on like how his brain works. I'm trying and, to get my dog in view, but sorry, there's going to be a little bit of stuff. I had a cat, but I can't reach her. 
Um, and so, yeah, I think that definitely matters a little bit, like how you interact with wildlife. So you, you said something at the very beginning of this and you were like trying to separate how you anthropomorphize the animals that you work with. Right. How successful is that? I mean, do you feel like that is an ongoing battle that you do? I would imagine based on my own experience with animals, I constantly do that. I mean, with my own dog, I'm like, you feel this way because I understand exactly what that feeling means. Okay, I'll answer that. And then I see in the chat that someone has asked about climate change and snow leopards several times. So I hear you yeah. and I'm gonna answer that question. Yes. Um, yeah, it's hard not to anthropomorphize animals. Like we see in Tiger King, like, oh my God, these tigers love us. And it's like, I, I don't think, they, they develop bond, animals develop bonds. Do I think my cat loves me? Yes, but it's because we're talking about thousands of years of domestication, which is not comparable to a wild animal. And it's not like taming an animal and domesticating an animal are totally different. So like tigers can be tamed, but they're not domesticated. So it's not the same, right? They're maybe equal, they're like equally intelligent. They, they form social bonds, they matter. Um, but anthropomorphizing animals is something that scientists obviously have to be careful of. Like I see individual personalities. Um, they're intelligent, uh, instinctual creatures, which is part of the reason that we are drawn to them. Um, but they don't experience life in the same way that we do. I mean, a dolphin is more intelligent than a tiger, probably because uh, you know all the things that we know about you know about dolphins and about like you know pigs. Pigs have like the human intelligence of like a four-year-old. They have the intelligence of a four-year-old human. I don't, I don't know about like how like a tiger ranks in terms of human intelligence, um, but they're not as complex. And as a result, like their depth of emotion, they don't experience life in the same way we do. So right. while yes, I know my dog loves me. I know my cat loves me. It's based on the fact that I provide resources for that animal and I make that animal feel safe. So even though an animal doesn't feel like love, maybe the same in the same type of complexity that we do. I'm not saying they don't, I'm just saying maybe not as complex. Um, it's based on different things. Like we might choose to love a partner freely um, and our animals, yes, love us, but I still think there's a degree of resource. Like, you know, my cats feel safe with me. Um, I feed them um, and, you know, like they, yes, they enjoy my company, but it's about resources as well. And so like anthropomorphizing, I think we have to be careful with that, particularly in the wildlife field. So like, like that's why when like on the collaring projects that I've worked on, you collar individual bobcats and you give them like individual, like this is M01, which is male number one or F number two, like the second female we collared. And so a lot of projects prefer to name and identify individuals based on that versus like, this is Carol. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. because then you're yeah, no, that makes sense. Moves this level of um, familiarity that I think can yeah. be awesome. Um, no, sorry, last question about this. That's okay. I haven't asked you any questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't give a shit. This is great. Um, do you have you has there ever been a cat or something that you have directly interacted with? that you find that hard to separate from this sort of anthropomorphic, almost pet um, line that maybe you interact with a lot. Yeah, so when I worked on Bobcats in Montana, it was like my first job. Um, I was went back in the winter and we had this, the PhD student that I worked for had this one Bobcat that she caught, he, he, was, he was an animal that was trap happy meaning that he just went to the trap a lot because he knew that he could get free food, which is generally like roadkill deer and he wouldn't get hurt and we would always release him. And it's like, you go up to the trap. Oh, it's M it's M one again. You know, we've, he growl, he's eaten all of our deer, the deer meat. He's growling. We open the gate. He shoots out. It's like wash, rinse, repeat. We caught him like 42, 43 times in like two seasons. Wow. And so this cat just did not give a shit. He was like, he had his territory. The trap lines that we were running were like in his territory clearly. And he, 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 wow. he the system. he's like, okay, I'm going to go in this trap that's covered. You know, I'm protected from snow and cold. Um, I am going to eat a bunch of free deer meat that just happened to show up. It's literally like my frozen meal. Um, and you can bring it to me. Sorry. It's like my frozen meal. Um, I asked for like a drink refill. Yeah. No, that, <laughs> having, like, yeah. I have, I'm having like, I approve. Here. Yes. Um, so, you know, cilantro. So I have, so basically I would ask, he would like show up and get a free meal 
and then we would let him out and it was really hard not to answer like we would always laugh and like kind of like speak for him um but it was really kind of it was hard it was hard and so because it was so tempting to just assume that he kind of liked us but he also would like beat us up, but we had an understanding. So when you create the understanding, it's from there that we run into problems. Like we had is that an understanding, understanding on an individual basis, or is, right? it, is that understanding on an individual basis or is it on a, so. yeah, okay. Yeah, he, he was not shy. He was just like, I know the deal. I get free food. You leave me alone. Like, I'll beat you up if you don't. I'm so big and tough and scary. Like, let yeah. me out. I've already, I've eaten three pounds of deer. I'll come back in three days. That's amazing. Um, and, but we had other bobcats that, you know, we caught once and then we never caught again because they were like, nope, I'm not into that alien experience. Like someone, I got, they got me in a trap. They put me to sleep. I woke up and I smelled terrible and it was horrible and I'm never coming back. And so like, you know, like wolves are like that. They get like, you yeah. catch a wolf once and like you will never catch them again because they know it. They hate the trap. They will dig it out and you'll never catch them again. A bobcat is so, like curiosity killed the cat. They cannot resist. So quick thing. My, one of my favorite tail, trails in Glacier, we saw a wolf and it was right behind us on the trail that we were on. And we looked back and saw it and we were just like, oh my god like is everyone around us seeing this and then it was fleeting right like it was, right. It was for a second then it was gone completely and we talked about that with locals I mean my my boyfriend's dad lives near Glacier and he was like yeah that's not common I mean that's they quite generally rare. run yeah they're not yeah. like the wolves that we saw in China were really squirrely like they're you know but it's part of that's persecution right so like people are very yeah. um intolerant of wolves um and obviously they don't like us but they're all people are also intolerant um and, you know, there's a variety of threats that affect wildlife, which, which leads me to whoever asked about climate change. I'm sorry, I don't see a name. So leopards are uniquely threatened by climate change because if you look at the fat, if you look at the way, I'm sorry, if you look at any ecosystem with regards to climate change, what we are seeing is that ecosystems are shrinking. And so like species or like species, like plant ecosystems, entire plant um, compositions within an ecosystem are uniquely structured around like their microclimate or even their macroclimate. And as the world warms really rapidly, that is going to involve some shifts and, and, and plants and animals have to compensate for that. So what we're seeing as temperatures rise, so do so too do plant ecosystems because in terms of um, elevation, if you look at like a uh, lat is it latitude or longitude, if you look at like a uh, latitude, if you increase your elevation, you're decreasing your temperature. So in terms of like, if you are a plant and you have this like microclimate temperature threshold, as the world is warming, you are naturally going to be leaning up. And then as your, your species are going to be propagating at a higher elevation, which means tree line is going to be rising. Tree line is shifting. So tree line, like where tree line stops on mountains is basically the highest they can go before like snow or temperature meaning low temperature prohibits their success and so central asia because there are so many mountain ecosystems and so many like high elevation mountain ranges um, in that part of the world uh, central asia for whatever reason seems to be warming a little bit faster than the rest of the world why and so that's really problematic i don't know all of the exact reasons why it is warming faster but that means really rapid change for the rest of the world yeah. and that is a peer-reviewed fact that's not something that like i just like plucked wow or, i didn't like, know made that. up so central asia is warming a little just a little bit faster than other parts of the world and so you think of things like you know like the glaciers melting or whatever you also think it's not just things that are melting it's that whole entire ecosystems are shifting upward to try to hide from the fact that it's getting hotter where they are and so snow leopards we call them ghosts of the mountain and we call we basically say that snow leopards live on the roof of the world because they live in this really idyllic beautiful mountain ecosystems that are above tree lines so like when i was in china we're at like 15 and a half thousand feet in elevation so I was taking medication every day to help my body compensate for the lack of oxygen because, you know, I went there in 2018 and I got really sick and I actually had to leave in order to prevent, in order to, to actually protect my, my physical health because 
you can die if you get really acute mountain sickness really severely. You can get like fluid on the brain or fluid in the lungs that can kill you. So it's really serious. Like, there's no oxygen up there. Um, and so I was taking medicine to like compensate for that. So like they're really, really high elevation. And so the question really becomes when you live at the roof of the world, where do you go? Like if tree lines are shifting, what that means in the short term is that snow leopard habitat will get a little bit smaller because as tree lines shift, that means all of the systems that are tied to like lower elevation mountain ecosystems are also going to rise. So you have increased competition. So like a, a direct example of that is that like common leopards, uh, Asian common leopards that live in Asia live a little bit lower elevation than uh, snow leopards. So they don't really directly compete with one another. Um, but like, I think it was like a year and a half ago, like some of our colleagues in China had camera trap images of snow leopards and common leopards in the same area. And so basically as tree line shifts, as these ecosystems rise up, you're gonna have increased competition for resources. So like your prey items are gonna be increasing or are gonna, your prey uh, species are gonna be competing with other prey for food resources. And then your carnivores are gonna, more carnivores are gonna come into contact as they try to meet their resource needs. And then realistically, that means that habitats and distribution is going to shrink. And so again, the question really is like, what happens when like the roof of the world keeps shrinking? Like there's nowhere for snow leopards to go. So snow yeah. leopards are really intricately tied to, cl to climate change. Um, and I'm going to take a very quick bathroom break. Go for it. Okay. You have- I will talk time? about things. Okay. All right. I'll be right back. Um, let's see. I am going to read up on the questions. I am. If you have asked a question, I haven't gotten to it. I am sorry. We've been talking about a lot of different things, and I am eager when Serafina comes back to talk about how space and cats overlap because I think that there is an untapped niche in uh, this that we should really be thinking about in terms of uh, uh, business ventures. So here's a question. Uh, so how much of a species migration pattern is affected by climate change? And so I, snow leopards not migratory. I don't really work exclusively with migratory species, but from what I do know about some of the migratory species and like, like some of the migratory like ungulates in um, like Mongolia, for example, as temperatures increase, vegetation composition is also going to change. Um, that might realistically mean that animals are having to migrate farther to meet their resource needs. Animals migrate, um, realistically, it's not gonna be a, it might be a seasonal migration or, or I guess it's always realistically gonna be a seasonal migration, I think. If someone can think of an example where that's not the case, please tell me, because I don't consider myself a migration expert. Um, like, but if an animal is gonna migrate, it's gonna be seasonal, right? or a, a seasonal example would be like, oh, we live at really high elevation during the summer. And then when it's winter, there's a lot of snow. So we migrate really down the mountain. So we're really shifting our entire like habitat or because our habitat has changed, we are shifting our distribution. Um, and so like as climate change really shrinks and changes habitat, that might mean that certain species no longer migrate at all or certain species are going to need to migrate farther in order to find what they need. So like, I guess an example of that would be, there are elephants in Central Africa. I don't know where, I don't remember which uh, countries they're in that might, they take like a once annual migration during the dry season to go to this one part of the world. And like, I think researchers think it has something to do with like mineral uh, absorption. Like they can't get these minerals throughout the entire year and they go there once a year to just like replenish their bodies with these minerals. And so um, as temperatures increase, some of those resources are gonna to continue to shrink. So you're gonna have maybe longer migration or less success or increased mortality because less animals are gonna survive as a result. Climate change is really fucking depressing. It's terrible. People who say climate change aren't real are not listening to scientists and they're not thinking about like the long game. Is snow, is climate change also impacting the snow leopard's main prey species? So in certain parts of the world, uh, their main prey species is different. It's usually ungulates. So in China, for example, it's blue sheep. Um, in uh, like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, it's ibex or markor. They're really basically large bodied ungulates. Um, uh, realistically, yes, it is going to impact their prey because basically a trophic cascades like a snow leopard, or any predator is only able to be successful on a landscape based on the number of prey items. Seraphina, do you need to interject? Okay, yes, 
my boyfriend forgot his keys and is locked out. So give me one second and I'll- That's get- okay, I'm on a tangent. We're talking about prey items, so you're okay. good. Well- this is real life, guys. It is what it is. Um, I've got snow leopard scat somewhere. That should probably like text my spouse and be like, hey, come get my, my cat poop. Um, so basically when it comes to like how a species is, just, is distributed, it's really a function of the resource availability, right? So like snow leopards are dependent on a population of healthy prey items. So like healthy blue sheep, healthy ibex. Those ibex and those blue sheep are only able to be successful on a landscape if they have enough resources available. And so that includes like enough vegetation to feed themselves and to successfully reproduce young from a year to year basis. And so that's why all the trophic cascade is like a pyramid. And so that's how like energy transfer kind of occurs. So basically if tree lines shift and there's not enough resources, you have a depletion in prey availability or prey populations, which means you have less snow leopards overall. Um, but, 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 let's see, when you do the mapping of your data, are you plotting it on a flat map or a 3D isometric map? Um, so I use mostly Arc Map or QGIS, which is the free version of Arc, which I'm super into because uh, making things more ac- accessible to more people is really important. Um, I don't really see things in a, th- I don't really work in like a 3D capacity. So I guess it's not really isometric in that way. Um, so I guess I would say like maybe a flat map. Um, I'm not really doing any ground truthing. So ground truthing is like when you go out on the landscape and say, okay, like we see from this like uh, GPS map that it's supposed to look like this certain products. You have to go out there and like verify, like, is that actually true? I'm not really doing that because snow leopards live across like uh, two and a half million kilometers across Central Asia. So I'm not really, I'm not at the spatial scale to be able to do that. Have you considered public conservation education? Yes, it's called Twitter. (laughs) That's most of what I do. I've done some cool stuff though. No, I didn't mean that in a smart ass way. Um, Twitter is really the best, like Twitter and Instagram is really where I feel like um, we're able to talk about these things because like, I feel like there's like a niche, like people are interested in wildlife, um, but I feel like people have a harder time relating to wildlife than they do to like, Seraphina, your work like everybody can look really up. do you like- everybody i mean like i don't understand any i don't understand anything about what you do like you are on a level that i am not but i, I feel like i don't know and and you should we should definitely talk about that when you went to the bathroom i said we have to talk about how space and cats overlap and yes. realistically it mostly starts with memes of cats riding pizza in space so there's really yeah. an untapped oh, niche fun. that we haven't d- dived into yet but I feel like, like, no matter where you are, even if you live in a city, like you can look up, right? And you can maybe see something about the sky. So like science is important if it's, science is relatable and education is relatable in only if it's digestible to people. And I don't mean like, I'm so smart. I have to make it like, I have to water it down for you. I mean, like it has to be, it has to be situated in the context of your life, right? And so like everyone can look up at the sky and see what you point. see obviously you're an expert. So like, I don't know what you do, but like, I can look at the sky and like, you can walk me through things, but like who sees a snow leopard or who even sees like, not everybody in the United States, let alone in the world is able to see a tree frog. Like That's what a really is a tree point. frog? Like why do birds matter? And so I feel like public education is really, uh, ba- or science, kind of science communication it hinges on normalizing whatever you're talking about yeah. such that it becomes a, like you only normalize something if you're constantly exposed to it right but obviously if you don't see it every day it's hard to like normalize it so like social media is a great way to just expose people to what you're doing and say hey like I am not this you know genius I'm just a person who's passionate about it and let me tell you about how it fits into your life and why it, it's relevant and how you can play a role in that too right and so that's why I think you know Twitter is just like the best I totally agree I mean not to start talking about astronomy too much but I think no do it (laughs) well I think it's it's, so it's interesting because I have a a sort of different um initial reaction to people understanding biology or conservation biology versus space and I don't think it's necessarily accurate but I think people understand maybe what a cat is you know whether it's a domestic cat or whether it's a snow leopard 
Whereas people think of supernova and they have a very, I mean, I have a very hard time conceptualizing a star that is bigger than our sun exploding and, and trying to, to like parse through that. And right. I think it's, it's a, a cool thing that really resonates between both of us is we study things that are not necessarily seen. I mean, one of the things right. I like about astronomy and that I like about, you know, what I do specifically is I can point a telescope, which is a photon collector out there and say, I'm, I'm collecting data about this thing, but I can't touch it. I can't, right. you know, put it on a scale. I can't, you know, do all these things that maybe some other field of science could do with their respective Thing. Right. No, that's fair. That's a good point. I think there's something to be said about trying to understand difficult to catch or, um, I mean, that's what I call, I mean, my field is sort of transient based. I know Patrick, um, who is in the chat can, can confirm that there's something to be said about studying space and then studying something that is fleeting, you know, and it's fleeting on a universal time scale for what I study, but um it's there and then it's not and you try to build this sort of timeline for how it um exists and it's very similar to what you do and you can't directly you know interact with it all the time or or most of the time even and so how do you build something that directly reflects that and how do you build a relationship with it and understand it and, and be able to understand how various sort of external factors contribute to it. Um, right. Wow. That's nuts. Right. I thought about it like that. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, it's, you know, it's good. I just, need, I just going, off thinking. going off. Um, okay. So I'm missing questions. I know. We well, got a question for top three whiskeys. Serafina go. Woodford, obviously. It was a good whiskey. Yeah. I like 1792 a lot. It's a small batch. 1792, it's, just, it's like a small batch Kentucky bourbon. It's got like a nice caramel flavor or af caramel aftertaste. Are you a dry whiskey or what are you? I'm ultimately, I will not turn down the whiskey. Um, I think Jack <laughs> Daniels is disgusting. Quote me on that. Come at me. It's nasty. Same. No, yes. Jim Beam is not, is, is basic is the same it's mildly better but i'm still insulted by it um uh yeah. i rye whiskey is good but not as good as kentucky bourbon and canadian whiskey is it's nice and smooth but i feel like it lacks a little something personally yeah no i the thing about whiskey is you can you can take it camping you can be in the middle of nowhere and you know, backpacking for five days and say, I got some whiskey. I'm good to That's go. True. Not as fire really whiskey. <laughs> I'm having a love affair right now with uh, trying to infuse tequila. With whiskey? Like, so I really love, um, like, uh, one of my favorite restaurants in Houston does their own, like, house-infused tequila. And I love putting ginger and, like, uh, Thai chilies in tequila. So, like, right now I have some, I have a jar somewhere in my pantry. Yes. It's got ginger and it's got jalapenos in it. Um, but I also like gin margaritas or are you going to drink it straight? Pro well, I do. I don't drink it straight a whole lot. Like I like drinking, um, spiced. I like drinking good quality tequila straight, but realistically, like, uh, you know, Texas, you know, Austin, I don't, you know, you're yeah. in Austin, you're, yeah. you're from Austin. Yeah. Like I, my parents are in Houston. Like I love a good margarita, but a margarita should not have sweet and sour mix. I want simple syrup. I want fresh squeezed limes. And I want a little bit of like Contro and I want like good quality, like hundred percent agave tequila. Yep. That's how it should be. But uh, I literally had dreams this week about margaritas in Austin, Texas. Uh, Austin has such good margaritas. Ugh, Austin's just great. Everyone who's yeah. watching should definitely go to Austin. Yeah, no, I agree. When we, I agree. when I got married, we had, um, uh, taco truck, uh, do both our, uh, rehearsal dinner and the wedding. And it was just like, we had, um, it was ah. like two nights of just straight tacos. And it was like my favorite thing. So we had traditional, beautiful, um, some of it was Tex-Mex. Some of it was like, you know, like 
like Juarez style street tacos. And then for the wedding, we had like this place called the peach tortilla, which I think is just a really peach romantic. Tortilla. I love the peach tortilla. It's so good. Oh my God. And okay. So right. they catered, this is too real. Oh my God. They catered our wedding. And so like they have, so like if you. They follow, are so good. Okay. No, you are not exaggerating. So if you follow me on Twitter, you should know two things about me. One, snow leopards are cool. And two, I fucking love noodles. Yes. Pho? Yes. I could live on pho. Yes. Like, we had noodles before this tonight I, I made it myself like it was kind of ramen-y and funny it was weird it was kind of like a bastardization of a lot of things but it was noodles noodles and broth that's what I live for I love Vietnamese foods like fuzzy yes. but I also like the three foods that I love is I love Indian food I love tacos well, Mexican yeah Mexican style tacos I was trying to think like yeah basically oh, I didn't want to like do a disservice but I'm classifying tacos as its own food group tacos Indian food and Vietnamese food or like noodles. So like at our wedding, we basically had infusion. So it was like, we had v we had banh mi tacos and then we had Texas bris brisket tacos and we had something else that was kind of like a little bit of like an, in like it was like a, v a vegan, like curry cauliflower, chana masala type taco. Yes. So basically those are the things that make me happy in the world that have nothing to do with conservation, but tacos and noodles very important are very important. Yeah, me. no, I uh, was born and raised in Austin. I went to college in Austin and I am very, very much missing the breakfast taco aspect. Mm, it's not, it's an underappreciated culture. I saw someone on Twitter a couple weeks ago say liking tacos is not a personality trait. And oh, I just no. that person False. kiss my ass because yeah, I no. <laughs> don't agree. No, I, I hope mean, you guys agree. Okay. If you don't have so if you're like me and you grew up in North Carolina where you think like black pepper makes it spicy, it's okay. We all got to start somewhere. You don't always love spicy food. It's totally okay. You like what you're like, and I'm not going to shame you for whatever you like, but just, just get out there and try some tacos. Like, don't be scared of the taco trucks, man. Like tacos are life. It's delicious. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's get to, it's been two. Oh, I know it's been a while. Yeah. I know. Questions. I'm a bad moderator. Um, let's spend, I don't know, 15 minutes. Okay. Talking about questions, sort of in a lightning round style. I like it. Yeah, yeah, we'll try to answer your questions. I'm sorry if we missed some of you guys. Yeah, um, no. So let we have we have a chat talking about each question. We're gonna go for it, and then we're gonna move on, and then we're probably gonna drink more at the end, and then we'll, yeah. Yeah, if you've made it with us this far, I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. This is like yeah. this is like my yeah. ideal Saturday night is just talking. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Um, I see some climate change stuff. Um, okay, so when you're mapping your data, are you plotting it on a flat map or a 3D isometric map? We answered that right when you were on a bathroom break, but yeah, it's mostly like flat stuff. I don't know how, I don't really have familiarity with like isometric maps. I mean, well, like- I curious because my boyfriend is very into maps and he really likes plotting things three okay. like three dimensionally but also topographically and I don't know if that's necessarily the same thing I no, would I mean like third dimension can be topo anything. maps are relevant to like what I do and so like I in order to understand how snow leopards move let me just like con give you that's not really a good photo I'm just going to give you like something in context into terms of snow leopards um, that's not a great photo, but I'm going to go with it. Please bear with me. Don't judge me. This is not going to appear in any kind of publication. How do I share your screen? Oh, there is it. Um, okay. So this is snow leopard range in Central Asia. And so like, this is like the most basic map that we would use. So like, this is the world. That's Russia. <laughs> that's Mongolia. Obviously you can see, it's a little blurry. I apologize. It's like Kazakhstan, some of the stands here. So like what I was- is, What are the colors here? Right. So, so like I was, so the, the salmon pink that you're seeing, is snow leopard range. So snow leopards are in this part of the world. So you can see how there's really continuous distribution in certain parts. So like snow leopard range, 60% wow. of global snow leopard range is in China. Is and so like last summer I was earlier. Say it again. Is this the C shape that you were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, when I was like gesticulating wildly and looking okay. like a baby. 
that, this is the C shape that you're kind of looking at. It's like a C shape distribution. And what this realistically follows is all of the linear mountain ranges in Central Asia. And so like China is like 60% of their range, but you see here, there's this huge gap. And that's because that's like low elevation, inhospitable habitat. Right. So, you know, like uh, I was around like here last summer and in Kyrgyzstan, I was here like along uh, the border with Tajikistan. And so like, this is about like, it's kind of a topo map. So you can see like all these little striations here, like all of this gray stuff represents mountain ranges or it represents changes in elevation. So it's mountains. So like the more wrinkled it is, we know that the higher elevation it is. So, like this is really flat, low elevation, lower elevation in India. This right here is a, it's like a classic top, topographic map. It indicates like higher elevation, but like outside of that, I'm not really doing any like oops, like 3D type work. Um, it'd be cool to do it, I guess, but like I'm not quite there yet, I suppose. Sure, sure. Um, I'm getting something about it. If you can tell if the cat is pregnant by their poop. Um. So like if you were going to do, uh, if you're going to look at, if you're going to do an endocrinology assessment and you were looking at their estrogen or progesterone, if they had really low estrogen levels, you wouldn't necessarily know if that was because they were like in a low part of their cycle or if it was because like, so like when, when mammals lactate, so back up, let me to put it into context, when humans have babies and when we are lactating lactation specifically milk production keeps uh, it suppresses your natural menstrual cycle i don't exactly understand all the specifics because i don't have human children and i haven't like asked any of my friends specifically like how do your periods change when you're on like you know when you're lactating right um, but, like if you're a nurse and a baby for a certain period of time it does suppress your um, hormone cycle mean that you won't have periods and the way that people have periods is due to like rises and falls in estrogen and progesterone progesterone is the hormone that maintains pregnancy it's so, like in certain birth controls that humans take you can either have an estrogen progesterone combo or just progesterone right. and the progesterone if you have like just a progesterone pill it basically tricks your body into thinking that it's pregnant um, because when you have elevated progesterone levels, that's because you're actually uh, uh, gestating, you're carrying a baby. But if you are lactating, I'm pretty sure that your estrogen levels are lower. But I think that if I was to just take a fecal sample, I don't know if I was just looking at those two hormones, I don't know if I would be able to say she has a, she's have, she's nursing a litter versus she is pregnant versus Right. Um, like she's prepubescent. I, yeah, I'm not hundred percent positive about that. It's been a while, but I'm surely someone who's smarter than me could probably answer that. that um, okay. Uh, I'm going to answer a question. What is your favorite nebula? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I have a lot of favorite nebulas. Can you tell us what a nebula is first? Because I, yes, I can. Okay. So a nebula is a stellar nursery. So it's where stars are born. And if you look up the Orion Nebula, uh -huh. um, which you can also see the Orion constellation. If you walk outside, you can see the, I mean, depending on sort of your latitude and longitude, you can see the belt, you can see the shoulders, you can see the knees, and you can see the outline of the entire constellation, which means you can also see Betelgeuse, which is the massive red super giant that I care about in my own research. But based on nebulas sort of in general, they are stellar nurseries and they birth stars. And I think a lot of um, galaxies birth stars and it's very cool to study nebula because I, I personally don't, but you can gauge birth rates of various regions of the sky and you can then sort of understand what you're looking at and gauge how old it is and gauge how far away it is based on that. So my what? nebula, I know it's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> I know. Um, my favorite nebula, I honestly, I mean, I think it would be Orion. There's so much going on in Orion and there's, you know, crab nebula, which I know some people are, Patrick specifically um, is talking about in the chat. It's so cool. I mean, you can see various shock waves coming out of the explosion of the supernova and the crab nebula. 
you can see various, uh, based on the color, various timestamps of things happening based on the explosion sequence. So there are some really incredible um, histories. It's almost like a map. It's a map of the sky that you can uh, analyze based on the color, based on um, you know the various, uh, I guess, specific stellar things that you're looking at, whether it's a white dwarf, whether it's a black hole, whether it's a, a brown dwarf. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can look at and you can date what you're looking at based on that. So does, does that mean that like, sorry, just a quick question. Does that mean that like, so if I look up in the sky, like I grew up like, okay, so maybe this is Orion's belt. Does that mean that like the constellation itself, like when I see a constellation, does that mean like Orion's belt, the constellation, that's a star nursery? Yes. So all constellation star nurseries or just some? No, there, it depends on the specific, whichever one you're looking at, it's, it's okay. dependent on the composition. Um, but that's kind of a, a really cool point is you can look at something and say, oh, I'm looking at it and it happened, you know, 6 billion years ago, but there's still active formation going on in that. And how do you sort of reconcile that birth versus, oh, this star exploded 6 billion years ago and I'm trying to understand what the environment is now. I mean, there's a lot of sort of time dependent things that you have to understand and also um, being able to reconcile them with each other is, it's a hard problem. Um, Orion is really exciting because there's a lot of different things going on in it. You Google Orion and you see plumes of things. I mean, that's one of, I don't actually know that's if the so icon cool. that I have for drunk science is Orion, but they're all like the, the plume that, that is in the icon of drunk science looks like Orion. And you look at that and you think, oh, there are stars being born there. There are also stars dying there. How do you understand that? So I guess quick questions. Like we worry about time. We worry about like in terms of genetics, we think about spatial. Sorry, let me, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, in terms of like any kind of genetic or movement based scenario, you're always interested in like the lag time yeah. Or sorry, from a genetic perspective, you're interested in the lag time. So like what I'm seeing, like if I was going to like test the genetic structure of like bobcats in a certain state now, it's going to represent like the last couple of generations. But what it doesn't necessarily reflect, even if it's happening right now, is there is going to be a lag time between something that happens on the landscape and when that effect is going to like be reflected in right. genetic structure right. so that's like from like a time scale that's kind of one of the things that are like like spe uh, species by species but that's like way less complicated than like determining how many millions of years ago a star exploded so can you like just walk me how do you determine that this star exploded or was born or died like six billion years ago like how, yeah. how do you calculate that so there are honestly sort of when you think of physics and you think of hard physics you think of integrals or you think of derivatives or you think of okay. calculus sort of things there are some really honestly like you need division in order to calculate this thing right okay so it's, it's it's very i mean if you were for example if you're a third grader i think that's when i learned division you can calculate how far away a star is if you understand the concept of I divide this thing by this other thing. Um, Fair, that makes sense. And I think that's one of the really incredible things about studying the sky is you are looking back in time. So that is a factor. And you're also looking at real time phenomena that happen in that star and that galaxy and that planet right. that you're trying to understand. And so mm -hmm. you're trying to correlate both of those time factors and trying to understand them. But some of the math that you use is not, I mean, it's not super advanced. You can do it, you, all you need is a calculator and you, or, or your mind and you say, okay, I divide this distance by this light time because light travels at a specific velocity or speed okay, okay. And based on distance divided by velocity. I can understand time. That's wild, man. It, it is. It's, it's crazy. And I think the first time I learned that 
I, I mean, it, I was already in love with this guy, but I think that was one of the things where I was like, holy shit. I mean, and one thing that personally I was really excited about, and I'm actually really curious to hear about an explorer of the earth is I've always been enchanted by discovering things. And I think that's why I love fantasy novels or I love sci-fi is I want to learn and escape sort of my own life. Right, um, right, right. And one of the reasons why I loved astronomy at the outset, and I still love astronomy, is because it takes me away from our current state. And I think that's right. something sort of poignant with talking about COVID, right? Like people want to escape. Right. That's one of the reasons this show or episode or whatever exists is, is people want to get out and learn something different, right. think about something different. And one of the reasons why I fell in love with the sky is that it was so different. It, you know, there was so little known about the universe. One of the things about the universe that I love is that we really understand 4% of the universe. There's 96% that we don't understand. And when I- When you say universe, do you mean space? Or I'm sorry, do you mean earth and our solar system or just our solar system or like- I mean everything. Yeah. No, and that's exactly, that's the exact reaction yes. that I had when I wow. learned that percentage. Yeah, I mean, I was like, why am I, you know, not to downplay marine biology, for example, but I was like, why am I thinking about the oceans when I think about the sky? Where no, absolutely, no, that makes sense. No, I mean. We are the first yeah. sentient in our, in our understanding beings of, of trying to understand this. Right. So my, I guess my question for you is, and I'm, I'm drunk, so I'm posing this question <laughs> with that caveat, but has that been comforting in that, in this time? Ha, and is that part of the reason why you got into studying what you study? And is there enough unknowns to um, captivate your interest and engage you and sort of drive you and what you want to understand? Um, because I know for me, the, the fact that we don't understand is the driving force for right. me. So for me, you know, I like the way that you said, like the fact that we, you want to kind of like lead, I don't know if it's, maybe it's not the right word. Like, I don't want to like channel Star Trek, but like, you want to like go to the next frontier. Like you want yeah. to expand yeah. that breadth of knowledge. And I think we, we obviously like, knowledge is power. So we need that. And I feel like there, I feel very in tune to like what you're saying. And I think that's really relevant for me. I think that like, I would say that like, that is yes, correct. But for me, in terms of like conservation, whether we are framing it in terms of like our current situation with the global pandemic or not, I feel like that like growing up in a rural community, I saw so many differences between, or like a rural community, but also like growing up on a farm, I grew up seeing wildlife in a less unadulterated way compared to like uh where I live with my mom so like my parents my, my parents like my mom and my, my biological dad like divorced like my mom kind of lived in like a more like urban setting and like my dad had the farm so like kind of growing up between those two worlds really made me see how much we have altered the natural world and so like real growing up in a natural world and realizing how we are not actually separate from it made me see how separated we have become from it. And so as a result, it's not like getting back to basics so much as advancing human civil, like advancing human societies while allowing wildlife and ecosystems and the things that we have literally thrived on to also persist. Like realistically, I feel like most of my interests, like whether it's like the individual fine tuned things all come down to like the altruistic interest of coexistence. Like how can, if I can do something to learn about snow leopards, that's just really fucking cool. Like I'm super, I'm interested in it. Snow leopards are awesome. They're amazing. But is there any way that like my interest and the things that make me tick can leave the world slightly better? And is it, it, it the way that I see that it's better is through being more informed. And like, I grew up in a really rural community. So like there was people that said, oh, if you go to college, you're book learned and being book learned isn't the same as growing up in the real world. So like, there's this real like a dichotomy or discrepancy between like education. And I feel like in some parts of the world it's viewed as 
this like elitist um, or, or mark of, it's, it's viewed as elitism or a mark of privilege. And certainly the latter is true. Like being able to have an education, you know, whether or not, you know, it's a, it's a basic right, I think, but it's obviously laced in privilege and there's so much to unpack with that. And I'm like, really, I've, I've, I've result, I'm, I'm the product of a lot of privilege. Um, but being able to like increase people's education in a way that is meaningful to them, it right. might be, it might, it's like, I see the world in a different way than other people, but being able to make themes matter to many different demographics and many different life experiences in the context of science or like wildlife conservation is realistically what I think conservation is about. And so like leaving something better is kind of like the way that I, that, that drives me. And I, I don't view myself, I feel like we, in conservation, we have so much of the, we have, we have such a prevalent issue of this um, colonial, this, we have, we have, the wildlife conservation is steeped in colonialism, like, you know, this colonist mindset, this, like, the white person is going to come in and save it, and so, like, I'm under no pretense that, like, I am the expert here, and I'm going to roll up in Kyrgyzstan and be like, I've got all these cool things for yeah. you to help cut the help like snow leopards because like fuck off who are you right um and obviously you know, I, never lived in that right like right exactly exactly and like saying say acknowledging that doesn't undo the right. decades and right. the, the centuries of that of exactly that that has been done but i'm saying that like trying to find an appropriate way in which i individually can leave the world a better place um, in the context of wildlife conservation is realistically kind of what drives me and the tools that I do that are just genetics happens to like selfishly tick off like my weird, you know, serial killer childhood like boxes, I guess. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> Here's a good question um, to like shift, shift places. Uh, someone said, how are you both balancing mental health versus grad school versus COVID-19. Serafina, do you want to answer, ask, answer that first since I asked it? Yeah, um, I had a, I, I'm still, but I especially had a really hard time at the beginning slash middle of March. I, so I had major surgery at the beginning of November and I am unclear whether that makes me immunocompromised or not, my surgeon is of the mindset that it, it doesn't, but I still had a major surgery a few months ago. So it's right. kind of unclear how you qualify that. Your recovery um, period is not, is, is extensive. Exactly. Right. right. And so I have been paying attention to this, not just as a scientist, but just, you know, personally, do I need to worry about this? Right. Um, since the beginning slash middle of February, I right. was like highly attuned. So I started working from home at the end of February and I'm okay. very glad I did because my office mate thinks she has it and currently, yeah. So I work from I home almost like a couple of days really order of magnitude before she thought that she got infected and got sick right um and so all of that is to say i have had a hard time adjusting no matter how sort of prepared i thought i was i think there is a global trauma that's happening and I think one of the unique things is that we are all experiencing said trauma. So it is different from me or you personally getting surgery that is specific to ourselves. Right. Um, I spent two plus weeks reading, totally not related to my field or anything. I just read because I needed to escape what was going on. Right. No, that makes sense. I'm now, I think, at a point where I'm starting to build a routine that is specific to my work, and I can feel like I'm being productive, but honestly, like, a real confession, I feel like there's been so much trauma that has happened in the last 12 months in the world and in my life with dual surgeries and BRCA and you know, testing positive and, you know, being worried that I had cancer 
that um, I've had a I've had a really hard time focusing, and I've had a really hard time feeling like I'm making any sort of measurable progress. Um, it's hard being a grad student. On the other hand, you have a sort of freedom as a grad student where I don't know if you find this true, but you know, I have the option of saying, I didn't make a plot this week or I didn't do anything because I was too anxious and I spent a lot of the week crying. So I think there is a little bit of a difference, at least in my own department, um, where I do have that freedom and saying like, unfortunately I wasn't productive because I right. no I think that's a good point I think grad school is a really strange time and I was I saw a headline today that said I was talking about how dark grad school like pursuing a PhD or pursuing like a master's is for so many people who undertake it because I think like what you like I have some of the flex I have a lot of the flexibility that you detail and I think it's like oh you have flexibility with your schedule but the expectation is very intense. So yes, that's a good you have, the, you have the ability to say, I didn't do this this week, but the expectation is that you should have done that thing maybe twice. Depending on, it, it's, it's institution specific, it's like committee specific. Um, I think that like, you know, grad school is not generally great for mental health. And I, I haven't talked about this on social media because I feel like I'm very private about it. And I don't mind saying it here because it's, you know, whatever. I've, I'm on my second, like third drink and, you know, we're talking real and like it's real life. I mean, grad school's, grad school's fucking hard. And I think that you would grad be- Grad hard. If, hard. if you have someone who says that they didn't have problems in grad school, they're probably not telling the truth. Like I have an amazing committee. They're wonderful. I, I like them. I love them. I love all five of my committee members. I respect them. They care about my emotional well-being. They care about my career progression. It is really as picturesque and as uh, team oriented and as positive as I think that it can be. And I feel like I'm not necessarily in the majority in that experience. I really am just incredibly fortunate. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that grad school is not fraught with like issues surrounding mental health. And I mean, with regards to like COVID-19 and help and handling it, um, you know, I got out of the field in September. So like last in 2019 was really busy for me. 2019 was like my boom or bust scenario for my field work. So I went to Uzbekistan and led a five-day workshop on uh, it was actually it wasn't field based it was lab based like I worked with the you know, that's think, amazing it was cool like I got to work with like Panthera like uh, uh some of my, one of my committee members and one of our collaborators who was an also a Panthera grantee the three of us basically created a five-day workshop in Uzbekistan with the United Nations developmental wow. program help this lab work with fecal DNA because realistically like I you know I'm not a heart, I'm, I mean, like I'm a molecular ecologist, but realistically, a lot of my expertise is in making fecal DNA work for science. And currently, there are some things that are not working for my dissertation, which is a different uh, problem, which is why I have both of these drinks here. Um, uh, but like, you know, basically, I did, I went to Uzbekistan, and I came home for two weeks. Um, and I actually had like a lot of, uh, it was weird. I have never had like a lot of health issues. Um, I had a lot of health issues between these trips. I won't go into all the details of them. Um, it is wild to see in real time how mental health and physical health are directly correlated. And I do not Ooh. understand. I mean, it's un like, for example, and I think people who follow me on Twitter know this, I had this insane rash and I've never had skin problems and it's purely oh, related shit. to Stress? mental health. Yeah. And yeah, that sucks, man. I mean, like wild. It is wild. Think about, no, it's true. We don't think about the connection. Like I, if you, the only thing I ever really talk about on, on Twitter or Instagram is that like, um, I've had chronic migraines since I was six. And so like, I am wow. fortunate that I am not like right now I'm in a good phase. It's very cyclical. Like I've got, I've got three different migraine disorders. So it makes, um, triggers really difficult. Um, it basically means that like 40% of the time, I'm basically in like a glass house, like what's going to go wrong and what's going to trigger a migraine. They're very debilitating. Um, mostly for the most part though, or for the most part, I don't have problems in the field, my migraines. That's just because physical activity and like you have to drink a shit ton of water and a lot of the stressors that the triggers outside of like hormones um, are not present. 
And so like, I've been fortunate that it's not ever really been limiting for field work. It's been a pain in the ass for lab work, just because like when you are doing like 12 hour lab days and you're like bent over pipetting, if you have any kind of tension here in your neck, it can cause like tension headaches, which trigger actual migraines. So it's right. like this whole like cyclical process. Um, but I had like a lot of health problems like last summer. So I, I came back from Uzbekistan and I had some problems that were not related to my migraines at all. Um, and then I went to China for a month and then I came home for three weeks. And then I went to Kyrgyzstan for a month. And then I came, I flew from Kyrgyzstan to Montana, which is not where I currently live for a week long conference. And unfortunately, this is a side note. I prom- I'm sorry, I, I'm like a storyteller. I feel like I tell stories too long. No, so that's great. I Kurdistan, like all of these experiences were amazing. I recognize all of the awesomeness that goes along with anything that I'm saying. It was fucking awesome. I don't regret any of it, but there was this day in Kyrgyzstan. It was like our fourth day in the field. We were in this, uh, this herder invited us into his home and it was awesome. And we, we'd gone out to the field. It was like, I think our second day. It's like, we were all still adjusting and, you know, it's kind of like hard to get things like in a good groove. And so we came back and I'm just exhausted, like normal exhaustion. We've been hiking for like eight hours you know, I was adjusting to elevation. We were tired. It was like an hour before dinner. So I like unrolled my sleeping bag in like this little yurt and said, I'm going to lie down. I'm just going to like rest for like 30 minutes. I'm just really tired. been planning a lot. It's like kind of like the adrenaline let down. Like you've done all these things plan it. Now you're doing it. You're just like, oh my God, I need a nap. It's like, I laid down on my cot and I have my sleeping bag and I'm like curled up and I hear this noise and I'm like, the fuck is that? And like, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon, like the sun's open. Like there's people in our like yurt talking and that's fine. Like I'm not bothered. I'm just like, I'm just in the corner, like by myself, like kind of like, I just need to rest my eyes. And I hear this noise behind me and I open my eyes and I like roll over, you know, like a full 180. And the herder's youngest son, who's like three is just sitting there, like looking at me like this. And he's like holding like uh, one of my uh, field team members sleeping bag in his mouth. And he's just like sucking the sleeping bag. He's three, you know, whatever. It's not weird. It's just a three-year-old being a three-year-old. And he looks at me and I'm like, I don't know what to say. Because he doesn't speak English. I don't speak Kyrgyz outside of like a couple words. Like sure. this, this is not going well. You know, it's hard enough to communicate with a three-year-old in your own language, let alone another sure. one. And I'm basically like, what's up, buddy? And he just like looks at me with making eye contact and he just like sneezes right in my face. And I was just like, oh my God, this is like my luck, right? And so like a week goes by, I'm fine. And then I start like getting stuffed up and I don't feel good. And then the fever developed. And the last four days that I was in the field, I had a really high fever. I hiked like- Oh my God. I hiked like 20 some miles with a really high fever. Like I, my body, whatever, whatever, it was just a cold, but it settled in my chest and I got a really oh bad sinus, bronchitis and a really bad sinus infection after all the other things that had happened in the other two countries, um, <laughs> in the summer. And so like, I, I left Kyrgyzstan, I'd gotten some, uh, some antibiotics, which did not fix the problem, but unfortunately I had to go to a genetics conference. So I flew from Kyrgyzstan. I didn't go home. I flew straight to Montana. I got to sleep for one day. And then I flew to this conference and it was like Holy a shit. molecular ecology conference with all of these like genetics experts. And I'm like, then they're like, <sighs> like dying, you know? And I had to go, I ended up going to like the ER in the middle of the day. And I was like, something's wrong with me. Like I'm not well. And what? they just, uh, they did a, uh, you know, cause I, I needed urgent care. And so like, they basically did like a CT scan of like my face, look at my sinuses. And they were like, your sinuses are the Titanic. Like you're all full of like snot and infections. Like you need some major antibiotics. So they gave me antibiotics. And I, first of all, the last thing I'll say, since this is drunk science, Montana is like one of the best places in the world. If you drink beer, I am a beer drinker. I love yes. beer. And I hadn't been to Montana in several years. And I went to this week long conference in Flathead Lake in Montana. And I didn't taste anything for like 13 days, which means I couldn't taste the beer because of the sinus infection. So I have suffered for my science. Oh my God. So anyways, the, the antibiotics fixed the problem, but basically after the conference, I went home for 36 hours and then I got on a plane and I went to Peru for nine days because I led an ecotourism 
group with some of my friends to talk about like responsible consumption uh for you know foreigners in like wildlife setting and wow and it was just a lot and it was great and it was amazing and i went to five countries in four months and i'm not complaining because it was fucking awesome i'm so fortunate but then i got home and it was just like this um huge adrenaline dump and you hear about that like people get out of the field and they get into like their lab routine or their office routine and it kind of takes a a, a toll on your psyche and like people get like seasonal affective this a seasonal affective disorder and i realistically think that between coming out of the field and just like you know dealing with all these health issues and kind of getting back to normal and you know getting back to like trying to figure out some stuff with lab work and like the season changing I was like not in a great place. Like I just like November and December of 2019 were not. I'm sure. And you know, like you know, there are a lot of you know, there's a lot of layers to that. And I realistically, I think that not all of the layers are important, but I think the point is important in that like grad school is difficult and people can do all of these things and deal with all of this while they're having a lot going on. Like, you know, like my dad is having chemo right now and I have an uncle who has a brain injury. And obviously like I know Serafina, you talked a lot about, you know, family dealing with that and obviously yourself. And there's so, it's obviously difficult. Yeah. Um, and I don't pretend to know about that. I'm just saying, I know that you obviously empathize with that. Um, and I think that I was kind of like really kind of fucking depressed and it was hard yeah. for me to admit that because I'm such a, a go, go, go person. Right. And I didn't go to counseling and I didn't get on medicine right. for it. And I maybe probably should have, right. to be totally honest. And I don't have a problem admitting that. Like I didn't have like a meeting with my advisor about it or anything, but you know, I probably could have, and it would have been okay. Right. Um, and so like, I'm not taking classes now. And so realistically, um, my advisor, you know, is, is like on sabbatical right now and I'm not taking classes and my lab work is not in the same institution that I attend. So I don't have to be on campus every day. So some of my day-to-day -day hasn't really changed a whole lot. <laughs> I'm, but I think it's important with all of the, even with, without that, without, like, if you erase everything that I just said, it would still be important to try to establish some type of norm. So for me, it's been really important to maintain a schedule. Like initially I was like, I have to get up. I need to brush my hair. I should probably not be in my pajamas. I need to like pretend like I need to treat this day like it's a normal day. And I did that for the first couple of weeks, but like for the last couple of days, I've been wearing like the same pajama pants like during the week. Right. And that's fine because I'm still showering. I'm occasionally brushing my hair, but I'm also like maintaining a schedule. And that's like, I get up in the morning, I take my dog on a walk by 7.15, you know, we make our coffee and like both my spouse and I start working at eight o'clock. Wow. And, but that, and, but I honestly probably wouldn't, it's not because I'm like majorly disciplined, it's because my spouse is a federal, is he, he's a federal wildlife biologist. And oh. so they have like kind of more regimented schedules. And so for me, even though like I have that flexibility that you speak of, I need to maintain some sense of like rigidity in order to right. measure productivity. But I still think it's important that whether you're in grad school or not, like whoever you are in the world watching this, I, I saw a tweet the other day, I don't know if you saw it, Serafina, that was like, oh, if like at the end of quarantine, you haven't like started a side business. I saw that, like, yeah, this skill, morning. Like, you didn't lack time, you lack discipline. Like, fuck you, who are you? Like, that's not how the world works. It's insane. We are literally going through collective worldwide trauma. Are you fucking serious? That exactly, you're talking about it. like, uh, yeah. I think what expectation ridiculous. is this? Like, is it entrenched in capitalism? Like, what is that? And Exactly, exactly, and it's like, creating some type of scale of like no, productivity no. based on capitalism or I, I don't know like what you want to feel good about yourself like okay fine do whatever you want to do but like the way that I feel good about myself doesn't have to exclusively measure up to the way that you feel good about yourself and I think that matters across science regardless yeah. of the global pandemic and obviously that's a problem in academia that we all deal with but like right now especially like fuck off I'm not interested in that quick quick question my I know, and then we should probably log off because it's been, it's been a while. three hours which is <laughs> I don't think I've ever watched anything for three hours I know I don't I yeah I feel like three hours I bet because also because I'm talking I know I mean we can keep going I don't give a shit <laughs> um I would. how is your dad how is he doing my dad is awesome I'm dad I don't know if you're watching this right now 
Um, might be, might be a sleep artist. My dad is cool. My dad has, um, is, is, uh, doing chemo for colon cancer. He just had this, uh, what, what is today? Today is Saturday. Yesterday was his 41st round of chemo. Wow. He's doing pretty good. Um, he, that's amazing. It is. Yeah. So he is doing pretty well. I think it's a combination of the fact wow. that he's able to sleep a lot. Yeah. The fact that he, um, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what it is. Like, I'm not going to make any kind of projection about that. He's got stage four cancer. It's obviously like really difficult, but he's doing well, all things considered. And he has like a pretty good attitude. And Imogene, how did they, how did they find it? Yeah. So it's kind of weird. And I don't think he'll mind me saying this because I've talked about it online before. Um, so my dad has stage four colon cancer, which means that it is cancer that originated somewhere it originated in the large intestine but because it's stage four that means it's a metastasized into other parts of his body so he has tumor activity in like his liver and kidneys and also in some of his adrenal glands and the way that they found it is really fucking weird um my for the last like uh i guess three two years prior to his diagnosis he suddenly developed um a really bad eczema on parts of his body. And it was like, uh, people, adults don't like, if you have eczema, which is like the, the, a lot of skin irritation, like, like scaly rashes on your body, like sensitivity, you generally develop that as a child. It's right. not impossible, but it's not super common to like randomly develop it as an adult, but he did. Um, and he, so the reason that it was weird is because let me back up my my uncle, oh my, I had an uncle who um, fell off the roof of his business three years ago and he suffered a traumatic brain injury as a result. And he, my mom has been his primary caretaker as he's navigated that process. And when all of it happened, my mom had basically relocated to Dallas in the short term to help care for him in the nursing facility day to day. My dad was still in Houston. So my parents were kind of long distance for a while. So my dad was telling my mom that he had like this eczema had gotten a lot worse and he'd broken out a lot. And he really kind of wasn't telling my mom how bad it was and she wasn't there to see it. So we went to the doctor and they gave him like a steroid cream, which made it like exponentially worse. But he was basically wearing like dressings. He would like, I don't think he'll mind me saying this. Like he basically would like take a shower, put this medicine on and he would put on like lawn johns that were like damp and go to bed because that's how bad it was. And he didn't like, I guess he didn't, he didn't really, he didn't really articulate to my mom that like 60% right. of his body was like looking like he had been burned. And so my mom wasn't home for like eight or nine weeks. You know what I mean? Cause she's taking care of my uncle. And so she came home and they're like, oh my God, like this is like something's really wrong. And around that time he was getting like some, I guess like an age related thing. Like he was getting like some, like a general checkup and he wanted right. to, check to make sure his liver was still healthy among other things. Like, you know, you get a certain age, you have to get certain checks sure. and they did like a liver check. And that's when they found the tumor. And then they found, obviously they traced it back to that. It was colon cancer. And realistically, so he has getting treatment at MD Anderson, which is really interesting because all the doctors are connected. And that's how they were able to figure out that his eczema was his body's autoimmune response to tumor growth in his body. Wow. Which is why, who the fuck thinks about that? It's like, oh, I've got a tumor inside of my body. Right. My skin is reacting. Your skin is going crazy. Obviously your skin is an organ, but we don't think about, like everything is obviously connected, you know, like nature's connected, like, you know, the circle yeah. of life, blah, blah, blah. But you don't think about that. Um, and so, you know, obviously it's stage four, which is not great. Um, and, you know, like I- Well, he's stable he is saying well yeah no we're really lucky he's got a good attitude his um favorite thing to say is like my dad is my dad is british and so he has this like deep better tone british accent i'm not even gonna imitate it he'll watch this later and be like fuck you you don't know how to speak but you don't know how to be british at all like you're too american like shut up but he like his favorite motto is still here motherfuckers yes and that's what he says yes. and so you know like my mom is in is an ovarian cancer survivor and so between the two of them, you know, like my mom's had her oh, 15, 16 year, wait, how does math work? She was in remission in 2005, whatever the math is, it was like 15 you, years. Sorry. Have you gotten genetic testing? I haven't actually my, for my birthday, my mom got me like one of those genetic testing things to determine. And I haven't, I get like a lot of screenings as a result of the cool. fact that my okay, mom cool. had ovarian cancer, Yeah. but her ovarian cancer, the genetic, um, it's weird because her 
the time she had ovarian cancer it was stage one so she's been in remission wow um, she, they she caught had, it stage one so my mom's okay so like my, i don't think my mom will care about this either like my mom's cancer was fucking weird my mom had a nine pound tumor grow in five weeks <laughs> yeah so if for those of you that are listening and you're wondering how cancer is different like the gene the genetic structure of cancers are different the way it grows is different the mortality is there's a real wow a ovarian cancer is a silent killer it's like the number one killer or the number two or number one killer of you might know you might correct yeah, me number one. Yeah. number one killer of women because generally you don't show symptoms of it yeah. until you're in stage four and it's very difficult to treat yeah. And so like my mom was stage one, which is treatable at that point. But the reason they found it is because my mom had polycystic ovarian syndrome and the cancer tumor was inside, was the, the tumor was on her ovary because it's ovarian cancer, but because she had polycystic ovarian syndrome, basically the tumor started growing, you know, the, started growing on her ovary, but because a plastic ovarian syndrome basically has a casing around the ovary, which prevents your ability to conceive. You're not infertile. You just can't ovulate. Um, and basically it's like an eggshell around. It's like, basically it's like an eggshell around your egg. Like if this is like your egg, wow. that you give you babies, like as a human, you have like a, basically some type of like casing around it, which is highly so virgin. And so the ovary started forming, you know, it basically you had cancerous tumor growth and it basically started growing, but the eggshell started growing. So the majority of her tumor was non, uh, was benign cellular growth. And so the cancer tumor was only like, you know, like that big, but the benign tumor was like literally like nine pounds. And so if it wasn't for her condition, <clears throat> she probably wouldn't be here because we wouldn't have discovered it until like stage four. <clears throat> Oh so, my God. I mean, here, motherfuckers is kind of like my family's motto because biology is kind of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Now, I don't mean to simplify it. I'm just saying like, you have to no, that's a positive that's, way. And if you don't mind me asking, how is, how is your dad? He's, he's good. He has been in isolation for the, almost the last month. Um, okay. Getting his medication was super. I saw that thread. That was fucking wild, man. It was so fucked up. I mean, so part of the reason he moved to Mexico is to afford treatment and to be able to afford living without working, which ridiculous, is ridiculous, man. Of course, like yeah. I mean, in its okay, wild. own sort of like genre, it's fucked up. And he mm -hmm. makes he, he travels. He's he's treated at MD Anderson, so he travels every month or every other month in order to get treated and to get his own medication now was a total fucking nightmare. And the fact that the border closed the day that he ended up getting his medication from Houston was, I mean, that's why I was bringing out in hives. I mean, it was really like, insane. It was insane. It was, it was horrifying. And he's never been late on his treatment and getting that he got it luckily you know, sort of right when he needed to. Right. Um, but it's, I mean, obviously it's super scary, but that said, he's doing great. He's embraced a sort of a different way of life than the dad that I grew up with. I mean, he does yoga. He is very sort of self-reflective. He right. um, is very different from the type A academic that I grew up with. And right. that's an adjustment. It is. It, it absolutely is. Um, but he's my best friend and I, I think we're very similar in that sense. Our dads are, are very close to us and yeah. you know, what's going on is sort of unfathomable <laughs> and we, yeah, it's do, true. we do what we can. Um, my dad always says that we live like several lives and like, I guess like, uh, I don't know if he means it in the context of like, you know, we say cats have nine lives. But he always says that like our, like any person's life, whether you're dealing with cancer or not, like you are several versions of yourself. It's like, you know, your dad has like made this transition as a result of, wow, yeah. of his health. Not, wow. That's, like, that's amazing. I, I think it's true. Like, you know, we yeah, are is. all facing this pandemic and it's forcing us to like confront how we feel about, um, I guess consider other people and like what do we think about productivity and what does it mean like right. on a day-to-day -day basis and like we are basically being forced 
and to shift in our expectations. And realistically, I think that we can't expect to deal with that without changing some faction of who we are. I'm not saying like the base, like the foundation of who you are as a people or as a person changes, but this is one of those times where like every one of us is basically evolving a little bit. And it's, it's, a, it's shitty that it's a forced evolution. It's obviously a shitty situation. I'm not trying to explicitly find the silver lining. Right. It's hard to do that right now. But I think that realistically, we have to be flexible with what we understand because everything we under, understand is changing. And that also includes who we are, like who we are individually, like regardless of what uh, hardship we're facing or what time, fra- fa- time phase, I guess, in our life that we're facing, like we're going to be several versions or several different people, I guess, depending right. on like how you approach life. And I think that flexibility is, but that flexibility and having a little bit of humor is to me, the only conceivable way that we can like survive the shit show that is yeah. life kind of sometimes. Do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. Do you think and I'm going to, I'm going to cut us off soon, but do you, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, do not be sorry. I will literally keep talking to you forever. Um, but do you think that your own experience with your dad and having to deal with mortality in a sense where you face it, but it's not your own and you kind of have to conceptualize it in a way that's really uncomfortable. Do you think that has helped you? helped is in parentheses. I mean, no, I understand. I find what that is um, during this time. And I'm curious because my own reaction to what's going on is normalized by my dad and by my own experience right. with BRCA. Um, so I'm curious what your experience is. Yeah, I would say like my whole perspective of life really shifted when my dad was diagnosed when my dad was like, well, my perspective on life shifted when I understood that my dad was immunocompromised following his treatment because of the diagnosis. Um, I, like, I remember the first time I tweeted about something, like I tweeted that I went to the grocery store, like I was visiting my parents, you know, it was like two months after my dad had been diagnosed. I think it was the first time maybe that I had seen him and I was going to the store, um, actually, no, let me, to make it more worse, like my, I was going to visit my dad. My mom was still helping with my uncle and she had to go to Dallas. And so my dad was home alone in Houston and my mom, he, you know, don't want anybody to be alone when they're going through chemo and dealing with the side effects of it. And he had been lucky so far, but he was taking a downturn. So sometimes people have a really hard time with chemo, obviously, as you know, and my dad was having a hard time, but like my mom had, like, it was basically that my mom had to be like split in two. She was like, can somebody come help? Like I went to be with my dad so my mom could help my uncle. And it was like one of those dire situations. And like, it was so bad. Like I stayed an extra week. So I was in Houston for like three weeks and my dad doesn't remember me being there like at all. Cause he was that sick. He's mostly been okay. So like, but it was just like one of those time periods of the chemo was just like fucking like really leveling him. And I remember I was going to the store cause I was trying to like get him whatever he could to eat. And basically I was spending most of my time like making really concentrated smoothies, like buying like um, yeah. those concentrated calories. You know, it's like, he's only eating like six ounces. He's only ingesting like six ounces of liquid a day. Like how many calories can I put into that? So I was making smoothies a lot and I'd go to like all these stores and I was going to like fancy stores to buy as much as I could. And I remember I was in this one store and I saw like this mom who had a kid in her grocery cart and the kid was very obviously very sick. The kid was, you know, I feel, I felt for her. That kid clearly had like the flu and she was like, you know, I'm, I grew up with a single mom. So like the dad that I'm talking about is not my biological dad. So like, I understand like being a single parent because I grew up with a single parent, but she's like leisurely shopping in the shampoo aisle. And I know I placed judgment on the situation because I don't know this. I don't know, but I remember tweeting that I was irritated that there was like this drooling, like weeping red face, like obviously very sick kid in the grocery store and the mom was obviously you know she has her own things to worry about which are all valid but I was frustrated because I was putting my dad at risk and I got some I got some like pushback on that and on Twitter like oh you don't understand her situation blah 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 and all of those are true like I don't know is she a single mom like 
you know, she might be just like, I've, I went to the grocery store like two weeks ago and somehow spent like 35 minutes at seven in the morning to get like four things. Like how have I been in the grocery store for fucking 35 minutes? It's like a global pandemic. Like what happened? Right. So I obviously understand all of that. Like it's easy to get like phased, you know, to kind of like space out. I have no idea what her situation was. So like me angrily tweeting about it was a bit of a judgment and I got some pushback on it. But realistically, I think that it, that experience and people being mad that I was mad at this woman for basically putting immunocompromised people at risk by being at the store, even right. if she could, it didn't have another option. It, it exemplified this uh, insular me, me, me that we all have. And it's like, obviously I care more about like my parents right. than the stranger's parents. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's a shitty thing to say. Like, I, I'm not saying that their lives matter more. I am saying their lives and their experiences right. matter more to me. Right. However, the qualification is not that they matter more. Right. And I think that like seeing my dad going through chemo and being immunocompromised made me realize even when we are doing things that are obviously safeguarding the people that we care the most about, we have to be careful as to how it impacts other people. And that's really fucking difficult and not always possible. Like I have no idea. Like that mom probably didn't have, maybe she didn't have any, maybe she had all the support in the world and was just taking a leisurely walk through the shampoo aisle and not thinking about anything, which is what I perceived and what I thought based on what I saw. Maybe she had nothing else to do. And she was like taking the five minutes of rest, that she had in the day yeah. from, all, all the finan- from all the financial struggles that she's experiencing. All that matters. And I don't mean to like diminish her or say that my dad's health is more important than like her health, but trying to navigate that, sorry, long story short is kind of, been eye-opening for me and like how do we navigate our needs in the context of other people's needs? right right and it's not there's not always a right answer but I think that so often in the past our tendency is to only think about me 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 right. which is why like in some communities we have this weird toilet paper shortage or like you know I was at the store and like they had a couple of Lysol packs this woman had like seven of them I just picked up one it's like dude like yeah. Do you need seven? Like, could you do with two instead? And I, without like trying to make decisions for her, I think that maybe if we had a little bit more grace or maybe a little bit, I'm not, you know, I'm not a religious right. person, but if we had a little bit more grace or understanding for other people, maybe that would shift our worldview just a little bit. And I might not have realized that if my dad hadn't have been diagnosed with cancer, maybe, or right. gone through chemo specifically. Cause my mom's had cancer, but she didn't do, go through chemo. Well, I think there's something to be said about being sensitive to someone's immediate other needs. And right. I don't know, and this is a, purely a thought, I don't know if everyone or some people or, or you know, anyone really understands what that is until you have to take care of someone who is right. completely mm-hmm. sort of at the mercy of other people. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, there's, really no way to prepare for that and there's no way to conceptualize that other than if you've done it no it's true and I everything but it's, I guess like everything is like a con is is a function of our own experiences and there's nothing wrong with that I mean you people some people say oh like if things only matter in the context of your own selfishness and I don't necessarily agree with that like you only right what is it what is it the quote by it's on my website by Baba Dio and it's like you only understand, you only love what you understand and you only understand what you were taught. Yes. But I think in all that's true, all of that is true, but also like you only understand, you only can frame things in the context of your life based on experience as well. And so like, if you can't experience it directly, like we're talking about here, you have to be able to conceptualize it in a different way. And that's why like normalizing science or like having candid discussions like this, I feel like are really, really relevant and are something that are lacking right. in mass media, in, not just in terms of cancer, but in terms of, you know, this coronavirus. And, and like, I can, every time I go out, I consider myself positive. Like, how can I protect somebody that's around me? Right. Like, obviously I don't want to get coronavirus. I got to kind of the fuck out. Actually, I learned one of my good friends today, her roommate is positive and they, I mean, they've interacted, you know, for the last three plus weeks 
And so she basically is at the point where she's like, I have to consider myself as asymptomatic positive. Um, right. Which is this sort of like mind fuck where you have to say, how have I been treating virtually every, I mean, and she's been super conscientious about it, but it's, I mean, it's hard and you right. have to understand the fact right. that you are impacting other people who do not have the same immuno, like sort of reaction that you do. Right. You and I right. have a very different immuno reaction than our dad. Right. And I feel like at the end of the day, like, is there's a huge mind fuck of a shift between like going out into the world. Like if I go out to the world and I'm worried about catching coronavirus, I will act differently than if I go out into the world and worry about giving others yeah. coronavirus. Yeah. Right. And right. so like, that's, that's what we, that's the message of this broadcast. One space is great. Two, snow leopards are great. Yes. And three, you definitely have coronavirus thinking about other people when you go out versus yep. they can get that coronavirus. Yeah. And I think that's probably realistically what we need to be thinking about. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you and I would both agree that the people, most people do not have the same immune systems as 20 something healthy, right. you know, people who, um, do not have to deal with underlying conditions. And even if we, I mean, I read a thread earlier this week that was fucking harrowing. And it was this 34 year old in Brooklyn who had no underlying conditions and thought she was drowning and was going to die. And it's, I mean, it's fucked. And it's terrifying. Needs to consider the fact that no matter where you are, you may have a reaction that is unprecedented in your own mind. And um, as scientists, I think you and I can both sort of harbor the fact that you need to consider that not everybody has the same reaction that you do. Right. And like, how do you, how do people, how does any person watching know that they have an underlying condition? Nobody does unless they get tested for it. And if you haven't been tested, you don't know. And so like things like chemo bring out underlying health conditions, things like viruses bring out underlying health conditions. And you may be totally fine, but maybe you have an underlying health condition that makes handling something like this viral load specifically a little bit more dangerous. And I don't mean that as a fear mongering way. I just mean that as like plain and simple, you don't know by looking at anybody, like you don't necessarily know by looking at my dad that he's undergoing chemo. You don't know looking at me that I have chronic migraine. You don't know looking at you that you've had, you know, that you've dealt with, you know, you have BRC1. Like, you know what I mean? Like you don't know by looking at somebody what their lived experiences or what their threats are. And like, just because somebody doesn't look sickly or like they're dying doesn't mean that they are not at risk for that. And I think that that is what makes it scary and also difficult to understand because it's not something that we see. Right. And it, I mean, to spin it in a positive way that. Yeah. Sorry. I just went really no, I, dark. No, I mean, my only, the only thing I was going to say is I hope that science communication, no matter what it is, whether it's talking about snow leopards, talking about exploding stars, talking about whatever it is when you're wasted or not, <laughs> um, you make it whoever it is accessible and exciting for other people to understand right. that science isn't something you choose. It is part of the universe and you learn more about it and you understand sort of how you react to it and how you um, conceptualize it. And that's part of my goal and I think your goal on Twitter, and I don't mean to speak for you, but that's part of science communication um, as a field is to make this more digestible and um, hopefully make it a little bit easier to understand to where we can talk about things like coronavirus we can talk about things like extinction or or stars exploding and hopefully have a little bit um deeper perspective on it that can lead our decisions in a uh sort of manageable way no that makes total I mean I think that's like well summarized and that's something that you know I think that normalizing science no matter what the field involves more conversations like this like 
you know, I try to do science communication, like on a daily basis on different platforms to yeah. do the things that you just said. And I think that it's a long process. And I think that having conversation, I know we might be, maybe didn't answer every single question here and I'm sorry, which means it just means we have to come back and do it again. Right. That's exactly right. Um, like I saw that there were, there was a question about like talking about women in science and honestly, I need like more alcohol to have a conversation about that because there are separate specific stories that I think that it, needs to be like its own episode i'm sorry i wouldn't answer it but i would love to in the future we can do um, a part two later this week. no let's do a part like once you've had a bunch of people and like people are like have recovered from seeing my face for three hours then we can come back and do it again although we can do it on the side when no one's watching because i totally would love to do this again yes um but uh, yeah i think normalizing science is important like whether you are a scientist by profession or by hobby or just because like you fucking love the shit that seraphina is slinging on the internet <laughs> i would consider myself one of them you yeah. know having these conversations <laughs> is really critical you know like just fucking like it, it's not just about like i love going and trivia and be like well guess i know the answer to this right because I've seen on Twitter, but yes. you know, not just because I really want that ten dollar gift certificate at trivia. <laughs> I want to like, I want to like situate myself in my life in a more stable way, and I feel like really knowledge is power. And the more that we understand the way the world ticks, whether it's by not cutting open our cats when we were children. <laughs> Or, or or it is whatever or it is, but only under train scenarios because that's how serial killers are made. And I just please, if you're watching this, don't cut up your cats unless you're with a veterinarian or me. <laughs> I have questions, but I'm trained to answer those questions. Um, or you are just like looking up at the sky and you're like, I really fucking want to know like what that nursery is up to. And I'm sorry, I'm summarizing your your field poorly no you're doing like, great. Having, like asking questions is so important to situate where you are and who you are in the world and science is such a great poetic way to do that across disciplines and have these conversations I'm not an expert in what you do but I fucking love hearing about it because it makes me feel more comfortable to know a little bit more about the world even if I know that I'm not wow. going to get that ten dollar gift certificate at trivia like I feel I more competent in where I am in the world because I know what you were teaching me the synonym that I would wager to make between us is we are both infinitely curious about how the universe works, whether it's right. at, you know, a state, climate, whatever level you right. want to, you know, filter it at. And um, that doesn't change no matter what time scale you're looking at it. We right. want to understand how things work. Right. And that's exactly why this episode this uh channel no matter how drunk we get that's the whole point you know we want to how things work fucking stay curious yeah exactly yes that is the tagline of this fucking channel is fucking stay curious that's what we're doing guys fucking stay curious um I'm here all night try the steak please <laughs> later <laughs> okay so we are gonna end the video podcast because it has been more than three hours and I clearly I know, I'm sorry <laughs> no you were amazing um so if people want to find you where did they find you if you want to find me you can find me on twitter which is uh my my twitter name is biologist imo uh you can also find me on instagram which is kind of where I got started which is biologist imaging my website is also biologistimaging.com. I try to answer questions regularly on all three platforms about wildlife, about conservation. I sometimes uh, tell terrible jokes and I will almost always respond to your terrible jokes. So please come <laughs> talk to me about big cats, about uh, your whiskey finations. And I will yes. also uh, defer you to uh, Serafina about space because I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Imogene, you were absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. So fucking cool. I had so much fun. You this are is so amazing. fun. I'm serious about having a part two because I, I have so many more questions. No, that's right. And when, <laughs> when all of this quarantine is over, we will all eventually. Can we go on a backpacking trip and go explore? Yes. Yeah, no, that's happening. If you want to go on a backpacking trip, please let us know. Come find us on social media. Yes. Tell us where yes. you go. What is your favorite whiskey? What is your favorite <laughs> cat? What is your favorite constellation? Yes. I love Stay curious. 
All right. Thanks guys. We really appreciate you guys coming in and we had a blast. Um, I'm going to figure out how to end the stream because I don't know how to do it, <laughs> but, um, thank you. And we will do this again soon. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye guys.